Much has changed in baseball, especially in recent years. Still, no sport has such a rich and meaningful history. That history has been passed along for more than a century. And so no sport has as many indelible moments, moments that resonate through the generations. Yes, much has changed in baseball, but there's still something special about this. The World Series is next. NBC Sports presents... The 1997 World Series. Tonight, it's Game 1. The Cleveland Indians versus the Florida Marlins. For as long as any of us can remember, there's been nothing unusual about Major League Baseball in Florida. In the spring, that is. But October baseball here? Well, that's something else again, and yet, in just the fifth year of their existence, the Florida Marlins have made it to the World Series faster than any franchise in Major League history. And tonight, they play host to Game 1 against a team whose lineage extends back to before the turn of the century, the Cleveland Indians. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1997 World Series. I'm Bob Costas, joined a bit later by Bob Buecher and Joe Morgan. The contrast between these two teams extends to tonight's Game 1 pitchers. When Oral Hershiser was dominating the playoffs and World Series for the 1988 Dodgers, LeVon Hernandez was just a 13-year-old kid in Villa Clara, Cuba, dreaming of one day playing for the fabled national team on that baseball mad island. Tonight, they hand him the ball for Game 1 of the World Series, in just the second World Series game he has ever seen. For more on the pitching matchup and to take you through the pregame show, we hand things over to longtime colleague Hannah Storm and her new partner and our new colleague, Keith Oberman. Take it, Hannah. Thanks, Bob. And Keith, welcome to our version of the big show. The real one. I'm so excited. I'm almost speechless, Hannah. Almost. Almost. But the fans here, very vocal. They're expecting upwards of 60,000. In fact, about 66,000 here to see the first ever World Series game to come to Florida. And the great symmetry as the season begins with spring training here in this state and now the conclusion of this series. And we're also in the Major League Baseball Stadium closest to Cuba, whence our main storyline comes in this first game. This Marlins team has has captured the passion of these diverse Florida fans and no player embodies the unique flavor of the cultural melting pot here more than the rookie pitching sensation from Cuba Levon Hernandez. Well this is goosebump time what this kid's doing. The 3 2 pitch. Well, the professional career of Levon Hernandez soars. His personal life has a void. 90 miles of water and politics separate him from his half-brother Orlando, formerly Cuba's premier fireball. The belief that he might even consider defecting like brother Levon precipitated his country's ruthless decision to exile Orlando from the game he loves. My brother didn't think like me. He had family, he had sons, and he didn't think the same things I did. Known countrywide as the Duke, Orlando dreams of hearing the cheers again, the adulation that now warms his younger brother, citywide recognition that could instantly turn into national stardom. But Levan's modesty and the memory of Duke's athletic genius keeps his fairy tale story in perspective. He was a lot better. He was the best pitcher there was in Cuba. 
he won a lot more games than anyone else, and he had a better ERA than anyone else. Nothing stirs the competitive soul more than trying to emulate a brother, and thus it is here. In fact, it's Levon's driving force. He can't pitch right now at all. In Cuba, they suspended him, so one goes out there and does the work for him as well. Levon is moments away from continuing his dream, his hopes and desires shared with a brother, each of them helpless yet hopeful that they may again one day share a game and a brotherhood. So, in a sense, there will be two Hernandezes pitching this game for the Marlins. As Levon becomes the youngest rookie ever to start game one of the World Series, there is a delicate irony here because the more publicity he gets, perhaps the more trouble he causes for his half-brother and their family back in Cuba. It's a very delicate situation. And as many of you know, of course, these uh, broadcasts of the World Series games cannot be seen in Cuba. Bob mentioned this is only the second game that LeVon Hernandez has ever seen. The only World Series game he has seen is the clincher of last year's World Series after he came to live here in the States. And he is in sharp contrast to the World Series veteran that he faces tonight on the mound. Now, some might be intimidated by the prospect of these screaming fans here, 66,000 of them, but this is the stage that Earl Hershiser craves. He is one of baseball's greatest big game pitchers. He has eight postseason wins, and he was the MVP of the 1988 World Series. And at age 39, he is once again a star on the October stage. Five-two Dodgers in the ninth. Got him. They've done it. It's the impossible dream revisited. When you've had success in a certain arena, it gives you confidence to walk back into the arena and relax and just go about your job. What is it that makes you so tough in the postseason? Wow. Um, I've been able to stay within my normal routines and have been blessed to have good stuff on those nights and, and have good location and been able to keep my focus. And I think we're very fortunate as athletes when we can perform on the big stage and, and not have our career labeled with a negative because you can have a great career and then have a negative in, on the big stage and everybody thinks you didn't have that good a career. And you can also be just average and do great in the World Series and turn out to be a hero. This is very likely could be your last shot at a World Series. I'm trying not to think about this could be the last. I'm not trying to make this a, some sentimental moment and a cap to a career. I'm really trying to think about this as it's a World Series, it's present tense, and let's just go out and execute. And don't think about where it places you in history or how it places in your career. Just think about this is my responsibility to my teammates and to my organization and to my city to go out and do the best I can. As Cleveland bids for its first World Series championship in nearly half a century, they send Oral Hershiser to the mound, and he is quite familiar with many of these National League hitters, especially the big sluggers there in the heart of the order, like Gary Sheffield, Moises Alou. Bobby Bonilla, perhaps the biggest bat in the Marlins lineup that Hershiser will have to worry about, is his old nemesis, the third baseman of the Marlins. After three unsuccessful playoff trips, he finally experiences his first World Series. Bobby Bowe's story next. Welcome back to Miami and game one of the 1997 World Series. And Keith, before we've even played a game here, already a mild surprise. The Indians have decided to skip rookie pitcher Jarrett Wright in game two and instead go with Chad O.J. who has pitched well in the postseason. Wright has as well. He was the pitching star of Cleveland's divisional victory over the world champion Yankees. He won two games in that series. But Indians manager Mike Hargrove wants to give Wright some extra rest and has moved him to game four. As for the Marlins, they are the best team money could buy this season. They committed $89 million to free agents. Perhaps the biggest risk taken was the signing of third baseman Bobby Bonilla. He's with his third different team in three years. There were questions about him, the ball player, and him, the man. But reunited with his old Pirates manager, Jim Leland, Bonilla has become a valued part of the National League champion Marlins. Cleveland is a team you are familiar with. You have seen them very recently. Are you the font of information for your teammates about the Indians? Are you the are you the wise old man about this? Keith, I like that. I hope so. 
Oh. What are you telling them? What are you telling them about? What do you say to well, them? Well, and, and what do you tell, tell them about Chad, OJ, and all the rest of them, well, Mesa? You know, they don't give in. You know, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, they'll they'll walk in a minute. You know, to face the next guy. If, if you go out and chase some bad pitches, they'll stay there. They won't come back in the zone. So if you can you can be extremely patient and wait for your pitch, you can have some success. You know, you got to get those those two. Uh, pitches that you just said, specifically up in the zone. There's no question about that. And, and you take it from there. Are you surprised that uh, you make it to the World Series 12 seasons? Ooh. You moved around. 12 plus. 12 yeah. plus. You moved around. You moved around again. You moved around yeah. again. Moved well around traveled. Again. Well traveled. Well You're traveled. a veteran. Yeah. The guy you'll bat against for the first time in the World Series, Oral Hershiser? It's like old home week. Yeah, really. What's he still doing? Uh, we've, pitching, gone, right? we've, we've had we've gone to war, war several times. I mean, I, I know what I know what he's gonna do to try to get me out. You know, uh, I have a you know I have some history against him, but uh, I'm gonna enjoy it. I ain't even thinking about that. I'm just gonna soak it up all in. I got a little patch on my hat that says World Series. I might yep. just take that and put it in my room. <laughs> But now, the, the flip side of that and the dangerous side of that is the guys who get there for the first time and they say, oh, this is great. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. no, no. no I understand you're exactly aware of it, what, right? Oh, absolutely. What happened, to some, or, some degree, talked to some of the Indians about 95, and that was what it was like for them. No, no, We're no, happy no, to no, be no. here. We're delighted no. to be here. Mm -mm. How do you, but how do you take care of that? Well, because we, you, you set out to do one thing. It's a lot nicer to wear that ring than to think about what if, because I was thinking about something else. Oh, no, 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 no. When I say I'm going to enjoy it, it's, it, yes, I am going to enjoy it. But I, I have one thing on my mind is hopefully I could take one of those little miniature trophies into my house and have my boy look at it. Bobby Bonilla and Oral Hershiser, who you see live here warming up in the Indians' pen, have faced each other more than any other pitcher-batter combination in this series, 68 times. Bonilla has hit four home runs against the Bulldog, driven in a dozen runs, and hit 295 off of him. So, so far, the battles belong to Bonilla. Yes, Hershiser's had the pleasure of facing him in two different leagues. And you know, when you look at Bobby Bonilla being here and his skipper, Jim Leland, and you think of those Pirates teams, those great teams they were on that never made it to the World Series, there's one guy missing who still hasn't made it, and that's Barry Bonds, whose Giants were swept by the Marlins in the first round. But when Bobby Bonilla came home after mm -hmm. winning, Barry Bonds is the first guy to call him and congratulate him for being here. The Fall Classic is a mini-series. Each night, a new saga, a new star, a new hero. We rejoin you amid the noise and the teal of 60,000 people here in Miami. First pitch about 20 minutes from now. And Hannah, this World Series might have three different rookie starting pitchers. And any time a young pitcher takes the ball under this kind of pressure, anything could happen. A 15 strikeout masterpiece or an early knockout. The key, whether they are rookies or veterans, is to shut down the sluggers. This season's strikeout king, Kurt Schilling of the Phillies, went into the hitter's cage to show how two of the series' most dangerous batters can be neutralized. For the Indians, Matt Williams, prototypical right-handed power hitter, very strong, can hit the ball at all fields. The key to getting Matt out is to find out in the first at bat, with a fastball on the inside half of the plate, what he's looking for. If Matt's opening up with his front side and pulling the ball foul, then you can move the ball away hard, and you can throw sliders off the plate away hard. If he doesn't do that, you continue to throw fastballs in there until he shows you he's going to adjust. For the Marlins, Gary Sheffield. A unique combination of raw physical power and bat speed. The key to getting him out is the first at bat. If in the first at bat you can throw a fastball in the inside corner for a strike, you will open yourself up to the outside corner and the outside corner off the plate. If you don't do that, he can hit a pitch from here to right here, out there. Out there in cyberspace, log on to MLBWorldSeries.com for Kurt Schilling's scouting report on all the hitters. Well, Keith, last year, one of the great stories of the World Series was Yankee manager Joe Torre finally getting to the Fall Classic. And this year, it's Jim Leland's turn. The 52-year-old has been in baseball for more than three decades. 
long considered one of the game's best managers. He is finally in the dugout for a World Series. He's with Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Hannah. Well, this has been one of the rare occasions during the past couple of days where Jim Leland has been off the telephone. He's practically spoken to everyone in the nation accepting congratulations. Now you get down to the business here. First of all, the situation for Bobby Bonilla in today's game. Well, Bobby's okay. Uh, Jim, I'm a little more worried about him up in Cleveland because I understand it's going to be pretty cold, so I'd be a little more worried about him up there than I am here. I think he's going to be fine here. It's not a, a pull, total pull. It's just a slight strain. Uh, it's there. We know it's there. Could have more effect in cold weather, but uh, I think it'd be fine here. You're about 20 minutes away from achieving a lifelong dream, and you've dedicated your life to the game of baseball. What's going through you, the emotion right now, as you settle in for your first World Series game? Well, hopefully all the minor league managers that are in the instructional league right now are looking at me and saying, my God, I got a chance. And uh, so this is dedicated to those guys. Jim, we wish you a lot of luck. Thank you. All right, let's send it back now to Hannah. Thanks, Jim. And without question, Jim Leland, the sentimental favorite to win this series everywhere except for Cleveland, that is. We are closing in on the first pitch of game one of the 1997 World Series. Up next, the introduction of the starting lineups. Time now to meet the players for the introductions. Here's Jay Rokich. gentlemen welcome to game one of the 1997 world series between the american league champion cleveland indians and your national league champion florida marlins and now Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm welcome for the American League champion, Cleveland Indians. Ladies and gentlemen, the manager of the Cleveland Indians, number 21, Mike Hargrove. And now, here are the starting lineups for the Cleveland Indians. Leading off at second base, number six, Bip Roberts. Batting second at shortstop, number 13, Omar Vizquel. Hitting third in right field, number 24, Manny Ramirez. Batting cleanup in left field. Number 23, David Justice. Hitting fifth at third base. Number nine, Matt Williams. Batting six at first base, number 25, Jim Tomei. Hitting seven, the catcher, number 15, Sandy Alomar, Jr. Batting eight in center field, number 17, Marquise Grissom. And batting ninth and warming up in the bullpen, the starting pitcher, number 55, Oral Hershiser. 
ladies and gentlemen, the 1997 American League champion Cleveland Indians. your attention to the third base area where tonight's colors will be presented by the U.S. Coast Guard. During the singing of the national anthem, we invite you to look towards the sky for a special flyover to help wing in the first World Series game in the state of Florida. And now, to honor America. Please welcome Mercury recording artist Hansen.
The pregame festivities have drawn to a close. When we come back, it's time to play ball with Bob Costas, Joe Morgan, and Bob Euchre. Back at Pro Player Stadium, moments away from game one of the 1997 World Series. And moments ago, appropriately, in this, the 50th anniversary season of Jackie Robinson breaking baseball's color barrier, his widow, there you see her in the background, Rachel Robinson watching as young Shamari Daly, an 18-year-old Jackie Robinson scholar, throws out the ceremonial first pitch. 50 years ago this season, Jackie Robinson becoming the first black player to play in the major leagues with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And later that same year, the Indians' Larry Doby broke the barrier in the American League. Now back to the present as we welcome Joe Morgan and Mr. Baseball Bob Euchre. Let's talk about the pitchers. We'll begin with LeVon Hernandez since after all he will have the ball first for the home team. Well LeVon Hernandez got the call in an emergency start in game five by Jim Leland when Kevin Brown went down with the flu. He responded with a 15 strikeout performance against the Braves with a variety of curves fastballs and changeup. He showed us what he was really made of the final out of the game when he got Fred McGriff looking on a 3-2 curveball. The Indians are going to see much the same tonight, Bob. He basically stays away every once in a while, comes inside with fastballs and breaking balls. Now, as for Oral Hershiser, Joe, a different pitcher than the guy who won the Cy Young Award and dominated the postseason in 1988 with one of the great playoff and World Series performances a pitcher has ever had, but still very effective and very tough when it counts most. Well, you're right, Bob. He has a 3 and 1 career World Series record with a 1.69 earned run damage. He's a great sinker, as we see here, and a hard slider. And he also so throws a mystery pitch. But you have to make him get the ball up in the strike zone if you're going to handle him. He will only throw strikes if you force him to. Look at that, 1.69 earned run average. Almost unbeatable. What exactly would that mystery pitch be? Well, we'll try to figure that out during the progress of the game. Is the mystery pitch on the up and up? Well, we'll try to determine that during the progress. All right, let's determine what Jim Gray has for us. He's down on the field. Jimmy. All right, Bob. Well, there is a major development. Gary Sheffield told me that he is suffering from the ill effects of a stomach virus. Sheffield told me that he came down with the virus this morning. He didn't want to tell anybody, but he got to the ballpark. He's been feeling bad all day. He cannot hold down any food. So when he got here, he told the trainers. They took him down to the Dolphins doctors and gave him some antibiotics. He told me that he's very weak. He's feeling only about 75% and that none of his teammates know because he doesn't want them to lose their focus. He told me he's going to try and play this game, but he will. Will be, he will be weak, but he feels as though he's going to be able to get through it and give it a go. Back upstairs to you, Bob. Well, they know now, I'll guarantee you that. Sheffield taking his place in right field. Here's Mike Hargrove's lineup tonight. Absent the DH in the National League Park. Pip Roberts with the injured left thumb that kept him out of the clincher against Baltimore. Back at the top at second base. Vizquel, Ramirez, and Justice to follow. Justice with a tender shoulder, but starting in left field. He had been DHing in the American League playoffs. Matt Williams at third. Jim Tomey is starting tonight and hitting sixth. Sandy Alomar Jr. is the catcher. Marquise Grissom was the ALCS MVP, playing in his third consecutive World Series. The first two with the Braves, and now this one. And of course, Hershiser is the pitcher. In LeVon Hernandez, fastball in the 90s, excellent curve, slider, and occasional change. All pitches basically tries to stay away off the outside corner. Every once in a while, though, he'll come inside. If you start leaning out, he'll come inside with a fastball and that devastating curve, and he's picked up a lot of strikeouts. He was magnificent in game five against Atlanta. Well, let's take a look at the defense behind Hernandez, and it's a pretty good defense. They played very sound defense against the Atlanta Braves. Charles Johnson, of course, no errors during the season. He made two in the postseason, actually one. One was the fault of Renteria. He didn't get the second base in time, but he is a very sound catcher, and this is a very sound defense. A little shaky over at first base. Dalton doesn't move around as well as Conan does. The normal baseball capacity at Pro Player Stadium is 44,000, but they have opened up the upper decks. This, of course, is a football stadium. They make do as best they can for baseball. Used to be Joe Robbie Stadium. It's the home of the Dolphins. So whatever the attendance figure is tonight, it'll easily be a record for baseball 
in South Florida. Levon Hernandez was 9 and 3 during the season. Up and down twice between the minors and the majors before coming up and sticking in late July. He won his first nine decisions. The first major league rookie to do that since Whitey Ford of the Yankees in 1950. His response was, who's Whitey Ford? <laughs> then he lost his next three and actually had a shaky September, but in the postseason. 2-0, and both victories against Atlanta in the LCS, plus four strong bullpen innings against San Francisco in the division series, with flash bulbs popping all around the ballpark. The first pitch of this World Series is a called strike. Man, there's a postcard. Up and in, ball one to Bip Roberts. Ed Montague, the plate umpire. Dale Ford at first. Joe West at second. Greg Kosk at third. Time is called as Roberts steps out. That's Randy it. Marsh of the National League on the left field line. And Ken Kaiser of the American League calls the plays in right. Well, that was interesting. I think they're going to try to slow him down. Bip Roberts stepped out right away. And now he slams one down the right field line, possibly extra bases. Sheffield up with it, not nearly in time to get the speedy Roberts. Well, he threw what appeared to be a changeup on Roberts. He started him off with a fastball to the outside corner, then came high and tight. This is a change of pace, and it's right down the middle, about knee high. And Roberts knocks it into the corner and right. He's got a leadoff double. Here it is again. That was a change of pace, and Hernandez in that final game here in the playoffs against Atlanta stayed basically away. Here tonight on the leadoff batter, he didn't do it, and it cost him. Miskell drops a bunt at a good one. Johnson is on it. Fires to first in time. Miskell led the American League with 16 sacrifice bunts during the season, and a beauty there. Well, he has not been swinging the bat well, so this is a good idea here for Mike Hargrove trying to get off to a great start here in game one. Now remember in game five against Atlanta the first man Hernandez faced was Kenny Lofton and he tripled. And yet Hernandez sucked it up struck out the side. Fan Chipper Jones Fred McGriff and Ryan Klesko in succession and stranded Lofton at third. Here Bip Roberts opens the World Series with a double. Moves to third with one out and Manny Ramirez stands in. And the Marlins infield playing up here in the first inning. Neither of these clubs has hit well during the postseason. Third ball in there for strike one. Ramirez hit 328 during the regular year with 26 home runs. And strike him out though. He fanned 115 times. Off the outside corner. Hernandez defected two years ago when the Cuban national team was in Monterey, Mexico. His entire family still back in Cuba. One and two. Well, there's the fastball inside. He came away with breaking stuff on Ramirez, and we talked about him not, he not being afraid to come inside at all. He'll do it. You start leaning out to try and get that breaking ball as a right-handed batter. He'll bust you high and inside, bobber down low and inside, and, and uh, he, he, he did it here on Ramirez to show what we're talking about. The infield in the one two pitch and away. Joe are you a little surprised to see the infield playing up here in the opening inning. I mean it, it must indicate to, to Jim Leland because his club is not hitting well and going against Oral Hersheiser tonight he's playing for a run here in the opening inning. Well he's not going to let them have a cheap run he wants them to earn it by getting a ball to the outfield. But I am a little surprised. The Indians formerly a club of big boppers have shown their ability to win close low scoring games especially in the postseason their last six victories in the playoffs all by one run and the other one by two full count 
And don't be surprised to see Hernandez come with a 3 2 breaking ball again. He really has confidence in that pitch. He'll throw it behind 2 and 0. He'll throw it behind 3 2. Pip Roberts, who led off with a double and moved up on Vizquel's sacrifice, leads away from third. Now runners at the corners with one out as Ramirez walks. Now sooner or later in the game you got to start challenging hitters. He went with the three two breaking ball that time. They put runners at first and third now there it is. There's the curveball curveball down low and away. Fastball inside good fastball fastball away again away. There's the curve down low and away and a nice play by Charles Johnson to save a wild pitch. Just as was the case six days ago against Atlanta. Hernandez playing with fire on the top of the first. Justice with a big year. 33 home runs. On the corner strike one. Bob, they're making a concerted effort to slow Hernandez down. Bip Roberts did it and so did Ramirez and now Dave Justice is doing the same thing. What they're doing this is a young player out there he wants to get in the groove. They're trying to keep him from getting in the groove making him think out there. Fastball high a ball and a strike. Hernandez likes to get the ball and throw it and they're trying to break his rhythm. Remarkably composed for a 22 year old. Liner to center. It drops for a hit. And the Indians grab the lead. One nothing Cleveland on the Justice single. But well, Dave Justice is probably the best pure hitter in this World Series. I mean, he handles any pitches that are strikes. The only way you have a chance to get him out if you get him to chase something. He can handle the fastball as he does here. It's a fastball moving away, but he goes out and lines it to center field. He has such good balance. And he attacks the ball. He's just a great hitter. Ramirez stopped at second. So a run home. Still only one out. Two men on for Matt Williams. Ball one two. And he hit 263 with 32 home runs and 105 RBIs during the regular year. And as you see, he really hasn't broken loose in the postseason yet. Pitch. A ball and a strike. That's the pitch I think he's going to need to be effective today. That was a slider, not the curveball. That was a slider. He's going to need that slider to get some of these right handed hitters to chase pitches off the plate. He got in on his hands and he pops it up toward the shortstop, Renneria. Two out. Excellent pitch that time. On Williams. That's what we talked about with him, Bob. Away with breaking stuff. He went away with a slider, then pounded Williams with a good inside fastball. You can see him turn that ball over a little bit to have it ride in on the fist of Williams, and he popped it to short. Here it is again. Watch Williams keep his hands. He, he's got his hands inside. You saw right there. He got jammed on that fastball and popped it up. You cannot be more overdue than Jim Tomey as he fouls it off. Here's a guy who hit 40 home runs during the regular season. Hasn't hit one since September the 14th. Has only one RBI regular season or postseason in the last month. Four for 29 in the playoffs and benched several times against left handers. Now the one thing about a guy like Jim Tomey it's like a boxer with a big punch. I mean he's got that knockout punch all the time. He may be getting beat consistently but he's got that he's got that ability with one punch to finish you. And the same holds true with Jim Tomey. I mean as you said Bob he's been lean as far as the home run department goes but he's always a threat. Either way I mean he can hit a ball to left field as far as he hits a ball to right. He's got excellent power all over. Ramirez at second. Justice who had an RBI hit leads away from first. 
with two out the 0 1 pitch. A ball and a strike. The number 32 on Hernandez's cap is a tribute to Alex Fernandez who won 17 games this year. There he is and then had his postseason ended by a rotator cuff tear. One and two. See, that slider is more effective, I believe, against the Indian hitters because they have to commit a little quicker. The overhand curveball is great, but the slider makes you have to think and react a lot quicker. See, that's the slider, not the curveball. Well, he looked like he took something off that slider. It looked like he took a little bit off. Almost a changeup slider. Tommy lays off two and two. Righties in the first two games. Hernandez tonight, Kevin Brown tomorrow. But two lefties scheduled to open in Cleveland for Florida. Leiter and Saunders. Tommy fouls it back and the count holds it two and two. So we'll see if Tommy is in the lineup. When the Southpaws go in Cleveland, it's very unusual, though, for a guy who hit 40 home runs to be benched so frequently. I don't believe they would have won that got into the World Series if he would not have hit the 40 home runs, and now they're taking him out when maybe he could have kept some of those one run games from being one run games. He may have hit a home run or two in those ball games. Another 2 2 pitch. And it's tapped towards second. Council. His play is to first, and they're out of the inning. But not before the Indians jump in front on the justice hit. Up come the Marlins in the bottom of the first. Jim Leland's lineup tonight includes an ailing Gary Sheffield. You heard Jim Gray's report stomach virus, feeling weak. Bobby Bonilla was removed late in game six in Atlanta with a strained left hamstring. Leland told us before the game he's not so much concerned tonight in the heat of Florida, 80 degrees at game time, but when they get to Cleveland for the middle three games and it can be very chilly, then it might stiffen up on him. Let's take a look at Orla Hershiser. Good sinker, slider, curveball. He will change speeds, and he has a mystery pitch. He's a very intelligent pitcher, but he needs ground balls to be effective. And to get a lot of ground balls, he gets you to go out of the hit, hitting zone. He will get the hitters to chase pitches in the dirt or off the plate. There you see the defense for the Indians. Justice Grissom and Ramirez on the outfield. Williams Vizquel can play it third and short very, very well. Devon White swings on the first one and fouls it off. I you know, think the key defensive player for the Indians, as far as I'm concerned, is David Justice in left field. He's been DHing because he has a sore left shoulder. I guarantee you the Marlins will test him if they get a chance here early in this ballgame. At age 39, Oral Hershiser went 14 and 6. His ERA was about four and a half. One and one. In the postseason, Oral has had three starts without a decision. He couldn't hold a 5 0 lead in game one against the Yankees. But after that, he followed it up with two strong outings. So his ERA for those three starts is two and a half. Down to first, fair ball. Tommy Whirls takes the Hirschheiser covering. Nice play. Well, that's the pitch that he needs you to chase to be effective. This pitch is not a strike. It starts in the strike zone, it sinks out of the strike zone. And Devon White swings at it. Watch how low this pitch is when he gets to the plate. Right there, that is not a strike. And if you swing at that pitch, you'll hit a lot of ground balls off of Oral Hershiser. Hits right at the bag. Nice play there by Tommy. And good covering job there by Hershiser. Hershiser got a little bit of a late start, Joe. There's the play by Tommy. And Hershiser finally busting it toward the bag. Got there in plenty of time to beat Devon White. You're looking at one of the great postseason pitchers ever career postseason earned run average under two Edgar Renteria runs up with Zittabunt and takes a strike Hershiser is eight and one as you see in postseason play three and one in the World Series two complete game victories against the A's in 88 including the clincher split two decisions in 95 against Greg Maddox and the Braves in the air to right Backing up is Ramirez. There's the second out. 
Now that's basically how the Marlins are going to try and hit Hershiser tonight. Make him try to come up with strikes and then go the other way. I talked to Gary Sheffield before the game tonight. I said, how do you handle Hershiser? He said he's going to try to make you chase pitches out of the strike zone. He said, I try to hit the ball to right field on it. I said, well, doesn't he come inside? Doesn't he try to keep you honest? He said, yeah, he comes inside, but if he doesn't really get in there fast enough, I can handle it. Or in there deep enough, I can really handle it. Gary Sheffield has a pair of solo homers in the playoffs, one against the Giants, one against the Braves. Those are his only two RBIs, but everyone is careful with him. He's walked 12 times in nine postseason games. Just off the corner for ball one. It was actually a disappointing season for Sheffield. He hit 250 with 21 home runs. A year ago, 314 with 42 homers, but he got hot in September, leading up to the playoffs. Two and up. It doesn't matter about what Sheffield hit. He's the guy that the Cleveland Indians most fear in this Marlins lineup. He's the guy they're going to stay away from. They're going to try to pitch around him whenever they can because they know that he can do a lot of damage. Especially now with two out and nobody on, they'll be extra careful. And Hershiser falls behind 3-0. and And that's the pitch he tries to get to chase just out of the strike zone. Sheffield very patient. Sheffield hits six, most of his balls to left field because he has such a quick back. He stands close enough to the plate that he can hit the ball in any direction if he wants to. If he wants to pull it, he can, but he does pull the ball most of the time. Could be swinging on 3-0. and We'll never know. It's inside. And Hershiser will take his chances with Bonilla. This is not a coincidence. Watch these pitches. We've seen him very sharp so far in this ball game, but he has not given in to Sheffield. And the 3 and 0 pitch, he said, if you want to swing at it, go ahead, but it's not going to be in the strike zone. It's going to be a sinker. You're going to hit me a ground ball someplace. So Sheffield is going to have to remain patient this entire series and hope that he gets a little help from Bobby Bonilla behind him and the players are going to hit behind him, Dalton and Alou. As Keith Oberman mentioned on the pregame show, Bonilla has four career home runs against Hershiser in some 60 at bats. Sheffield will steal a base if you ignore him. He did it against the Giants in a crucial ninth inning situation in the division series. Well, he's been battling a, a flu bug today. I'm sure he was feeling a lot better in that uh, series against the Giants and the Braves for that matter. But Sheffield's a competitor. I mean, this guy will play. He's, he's not feeling all that well, but he's in there tonight. One and one to Bonilla, who after all those years with contending teams in both leagues, is now experiencing his first World Series at bat. Lots of playoff experience. But this is number one in the World Series. They got him leaning, and they almost picked him off. Wow. And Sheffield's reactions there, very slow. And uh, Gary uh, may have knocked the wind out of himself here. There's the move by Hershiser, and a very close play at first. Tomei tagged him high up around the shoulder or the back. Here it is again from another angle. Sheffield got in there. He just beat that throw. And again, another look. And almost picked him off. That's why you dive to the outside part of the base when you go back, because the first baseman is always going to catch the ball inside the bag and have to come to you. And that's why he was safe. The throw actually beat him, but he got there because he went to the outside of the bag. I tell you, if Sheffield was feeling bad before he dove back to the bag, he looked like he was feeling a lot worse after he got up. 1-1 one, one pitch to Bonilla. Two balls and a strike. Just watching Gary Sheffield down at first, Bob, he, he really does look like he's, he's under the weather now. I mean, his reactions are very slow. He looks like he's having problems. When he taps it foul, the last thing you want to do is pull yourself out of a World Series game. But look at Sheffield. He's moving his hat. He's using his uniform sleeve to towel the sweat off his face. He does look like he's laboring. Yep. yep. And 
only the, the upset stomach and everything else, but the aches and pains that go along with the flu. And he's had them all day. Two two. Popped up left side. Matt Williams over for a look. But it makes the seats. Well, as most fans recall, Kevin Brown was sidelined by an intestinal virus and bumped from scheduled starts in games four and five against the Atlanta Braves in the LCS. LeVon Hernandez took his start in the fifth game and emerged as a star. That's why he's the starter in this World Series opener. This is what's known as adversity turned into strategy. <laughs> Hernandez with the rotator cuff, Brown with the virus, and Hernandez an overnight sensation. Brown will start game two here tomorrow. Mia got a little piece of it. All you have to do is watch where Hershiser's pitches are. They start in the strike zone and sink out. You have to be a little more patient than they have been here in the first inning. Watch this pitch. See that pitch is not a strike when it gets to the plate. And if you're chasing a sinker, you're going to hit a lot of ground balls if you swing at that pitch all day. You have to make him get the ball up, but you have to be patient. Keep swinging and fouling like that. Eddie Montague is going to be feeling a lot worse after the next couple of innings too. And Bonilla goes down on strikes. No runs, no hit, a walk, and a man is left. One nothing, Cleveland. NBC. It's only about 90 miles from Miami to Cuba, about the distance between Los Angeles and San Diego. But it might as well be a world away for LeVon Hernandez as he faces Sandy Alomar Jr. to start the second. All of Hernandez's family is back in Cuba, including his half-brother Orlando, nicknamed El Duque, member of the 1992 Olympic gold medal winning Cuban team, has the highest winning percentage in Cuban baseball history. A ball and a strike. But Orlando is now banned from international competition, pitching softball on weekends, as we understand it, because the Cuban government suspects that he tried to defect, as his brother did. One and two. In fact, about 20 Cuban baseball players have defected in the last few years. That's led to eight players and coaches being banned from Cuban baseball. They remain on the island. Strike three. First strikeout of the night for LeVon Hernandez. And this is what he has to do. Here's the hard slider after the first pitch. Slider away. That pitch makes him effective. Now he comes back inside with a fastball. Now he hits the outside corner with another fastball. That slider set everything up in that sequence. He needs that slider against the right-handed hitters of the Indians. Now he faces Grissom. The LCS MVP, number of timely hits and plays that he was involved in. One and one. There's an agent doing 15 years in a Cuban prison, suspected of helping players attempt to defect, including Levon's half brother Orlando. One and two. The Cuban national team in disarray now. They recently lost an international tournament for the first time in a decade, went three and six on a tour of Japan. Two and two. And a trip to Mexico was canceled because of the fear of further defections. And although we're less than 100 miles from Cuba, it's uncertain whether Hernandez's family can follow this game. They try to pick up Spanish language radio broadcasts. It's doubtful that there's any live television of this game right now in Cuba. Fouled off and out of play, still two and two. The one thing I'm noticing this inning, Bob, is he is working much quicker. They're not delaying him as much. I really believe that was a tactic that the Indians decided they wanted to have because they probably watched him on video and he was working very quickly. He seems to get in the groove when he works quickly. Full count. 
with the pitcher Hirschheiser on deck. He's throwing a lot more fastballs too, Joe. Not only is he speeding up his delivery, but he in the in the opening inning, the off-speed stuff, a couple of changeups got him in trouble. Here in the second, going more with the hard stuff, hard slider, and the fastballs away. His second strikeout of the inning. Another perfect fastball on the outside corner. Well, again, Hernandez going away to the outside on Grissom. And you get a look at it. This is what Grissom saw. Outside corner fastball. He cut through it a second strikeout in the inning. Here it is again. That pitch right on the outside corner. Grissom tried to go that way. He was a little bit late. Go the other way on him. So he gets Alomar looking and Grissom swinging. And now Hershiser, always a good hitter in the National League. Career 213 hitter had three hits in game two of the 88 World Series against Oakland. This year he had three at bats in interleague play without a hit. One and one. Well, you're not messing around with Hershiser either. There you see some of the uh, some of the company that uh, Oral Hershiser has joined. Three hits in a game. World Series pitchers. No video available of the first several names That's in that all group. Eight millimeter. Yep. Actually, still shots. <laughs> two and two to Hershiser. And the fans reacting in anticipation of Hernandez striking out the side, which he does. Keith Alderman back in Florida. Uh, Oral, there's a thing there. Oral, he hit his head but got nothing but laughs from the dugout. And he's okay. Low bridge, Bob. Luckily, well padded. <laughs> I wonder if one of the players reminded him that he just walked into that beam. He didn't seem to think he he hit it at all. And as you said, Bob, well padded. Working with a one nothing lead, he faces an old acquaintance in Darren Dalton. As we move to the bottom half of the second, Dalton has had just four postseason at bats with one hit, drawing the start tonight. One of the reasons Dalton's in there is he's a good low ball hitter. And we've seen Hershiser keeping everything knee high and below. And he handles a low fastball very well. There's Jeff Conine blowing the bubble, who has more or less been their starting first baseman in this postseason, with Dalton getting occasional duty. Two and one. Early in his career, Hershiser was still a sinker slider guy. But he threw both harder. He was a lot like Kevin Brown. He threw that very hard, heavy sinker. He was a power pitcher early, Bob. You're right. Fastball in the 90s. And then the, uh, the very sharp breaking stuff. And the other thing, too, and, and, and we've all seen Hershiser pitch for many, many years. I think he came inside a lot more. I mean, he was very intimidating. I mean, he'd really back you off of there and move you out. If you were leaning out to try and get that breaking ball, I mean, he'd really move you back. His 2 2 pitch to Dalton. Hit in the air to deep center field. Grissom goes back, has a beat on it, and makes the catch. This is an asymmetrical ballpark. As we said, just a converted football stadium. It's 330 down the left field line, 345 to right, 361 and straightaway left. We'll get back to that in a moment. So he gets that pitch up a little bit. And he hits that one hard to center field. The wind's blowing in a little bit from left, from right center towards home plate. Well, it rained here all afternoon. And uh, finally, prior to the game, it stopped. Humidity is very heavy, maybe, uh, maybe holding the ball up a little bit. Strike one to Moises Salou. Charles Johnson on deck. Now, Lou, without a homer in the postseason, batting just 138. 
to finish up. It's 385 to straightaway right. 404 just to the right field side of center. And then there's, I don't know if it's a nook or a cranny, but it's a little area over there where the fence juts out at an angle, and it's 434 to that part of the ballpark. Struck him out. Second strikeout for Hershiser. Folks, you can follow the World Series online at MLBWorldSeries.com. Red shortstop Barry Larkin is online right now and throughout every game of the series, answering your questions and commenting on the game. It's all at MLBWorldSeries.com. That's a look at tonight's page. As Charles Johnson settles in, Hershiser walks Sheffield with two out in the first. That's the only Marlin base runner to this point. Well, he's gotten away with a couple of fastballs upstairs. No matter how many times you hear hitters talk about a guy like Hershiser, make him bring it up, make him bring it up, they still chase those low sinkers or low off speed pitches. Something else to be aware of about the dimensions of this park there's a very high scoreboard atop the fence that extends all the way from near the left field line out towards center field but there's an area just off the left field line where a line drive would get out for a home run where the barrier is lower hit it more toward the gap and you probably have a double on the same ball there you see it if you pull it right down the line you can get it over the low fence two oh pitch Roll to a third. Matt Williams across the diamond and Hershiser works a perfect second. After two in South Florida. One nothing Indians. For the Cleveland order in the top of the third, Roberts, Vizquel, and Ramirez to face Levon Hernandez. Roberts began the game with a double down the right field line and eventually scored on a justice single. Alan, that may be the last changeup that Robert sees in this game. The Marlins outfield shades him to hit to left, and Hernandez got that changeup in and up, and he drilled a bullet down the right field line. Bobby Bonilla playing him up very shallow at third, protecting against the bunt. Two and zero. Roberts hit 302 between Kansas City and Cleveland. Acquired in an August 31st deal by the Indians, just in time to be eligible for the postseason, the first of his 11 year career. For those of you who are wondering why Tony Fernandez is not playing after he hit the game winning home run against Baltimore, it's because they would not have a leadoff hitter when Fernandez is in there. Bip Roberts is a good leadoff hitter. He smacks one toward the gap. It drops for a hit. Let's see if he can get two. Devon White is up with it, and Roberts speeds in easily. His second consecutive double. And again, a pitch about knee high and right down the middle, and he jumped all over it. Hernandez trying to stay away on him, but this pitch is right down the middle, and Roberts jumped all over it and drills a double to the gap in right center. There it is, right down the middle, hit it right on the fat part of the bat, and luckily, you know, this, this field is very damp and wet from all the rain today. That ball actually plugged. If it's dry, it might get all the way to the wall for a three-base hit. He's in there with a double. Well, when he doubled to open the first, Vizquel was called upon to sacrifice. Same situation here in the third. There's a balloon flying around out in center field, and uh, play is going to continue. Eddie Montague said, so what? Let's play. Bonilla in close. Dalton inching in. Vizquel looking to bond and fouling it off. Showing you how fate can take a hand, and it did so often in this Cleveland postseason. Roberts was scheduled to start game six in Baltimore during batting practice. Tony Fernandez hits a line drive that comes toward Bip. He puts his glove up. It bends his left thumb back. They have to remove him from the lineup, and it's Fernandez who eventually connects on the extra inning home run to win a one nothing game up high this is part of a series where they scored two runs on a wild pitch scored the winning run of another game on a botched squeeze bunt 
where they couldn't hit anything off Mike Messina and yet won both games that Messina was so masterful in for Baltimore. Go figure. Two and one. The first inning, Vizquel just squared around and sacrificed. Now he's going to try to drop it down the third base line and beat it out for a base hit. He's not going to give himself up as easily as he did in the first inning. And Bonilla with that hamstring, that slight hamstring pull, Joe, on a quick charge, it could be a problem for him. Swinging away and ripping one to right, Sheffield in pursuit makes the catch. Retreating to tag is Roberts, and he moves up to third. So it serves the same purpose. Now Vizquel every once in a while, if he gets something off speed or a fastball in there and he's looking in there, he can pull and sometimes hit with a little power. And he turned around on that one and hit it to Sheffield in right and deep, deep enough for Roberts to tag and go to third. There it is. Here it is again. This is a fastball and Vizquel looking for it. Hit it to deep right. Good running catch by Sheffield. And again, Gary Sheffield not feeling 100%. Bothered by a flu bug. He's having problems tonight. They're going to play the infield in as they did in the first inning. Same situation. Ramirez at the plate. Takes a ball high. He walked his first time. This is on deck. Hernandez already trailing Hirschheiser 1 0. 2 0. Well, Ramirez is one of those guys that you can't stay the same way on him all the time. He's got good power the other way. There's a big gap in right center for him. And occasionally he'll go down to right field line. I mean, if he's looking out there, he'll go that way. You can't keep him the same way all the time. He lays off and it's 3 and 0. This is what I'm talking about on Ramirez. Pretty pretty well dispersed. 76 of his base hits to to left, but look at the center and right. You'll move it around. He walks him on four pitches. His second walk each to Ramirez. He struck out the side in the second inning. And David Justice, a great hitter. He gets a fastball down and out over the plate and lines up the center field for a base hit. He's the one guy they were, they should try to stay away from in this series, but anytime you get runners in scoring position, you have to pitch to him. In this situation, you have to try to get the ball down and hope he hits a ground ball at someone because you're not going to strike him out in this situation. He's such a good hitter. He knows he has to put the ball in play. Roberts at third and Ramirez at first with one out of the Cleveland third trying to add to a one nothing lead. Ball one to Justice who came over with Marquise Grissom in the deal that sent Alan Embry the left hander and Kenny Lofton to Atlanta. A deal which on balance the Indians now feel they got much the better of. He pops it back behind the plate. Johnson has no play. Good pitch there from Hernandez. Fastball up and in. You might get a pop up out of Justice on that pitch. Good spot for it. They throw him a breaking ball away and then they came right back with a fastball under the hands. I think that's where you have to try to pitch him with the fastball. You got to stay in tight if you can. But if you get the ball out over the plate, you're going to be in trouble. So you have to stay tight and miss off the plate inside if you're going to miss. This ball is hit in the air back of short. Renteria going out. Coming in from left is Moises Alou. He makes the catch. Roberts draws a throw but holds. First and third with two out. So Justice, who came through in the first, unable to bring the runner in from third with less than two out here. Well, you have to give Hernandez credit. Watch where this pitch is. Same location as the last one. Inside and up. See how Justice has to pull his hands in to try to get to it. And he pops it up. That's what you can get out of that pitch from him. A pop up on the fastball in. But you can't make mistakes out over the plate with him. Good pitching there by Hernandez. Now Matt Williams who popped to short his first time up in the first inning. And 
And the former Giant takes a strike. Here's the scouting report on him. Matt Williams, fastballs in and up. He'll chase breaking balls off the plate and more apt to chase him with two strikes and with runners in scoring position. But be careful out there with Williams. This ball has popped wide of first. Dalton has no play. He's, He's got excellent power the other way, Joe. He'll go to right center on pitches and especially breaking balls out there if they're up. Hernandez is making better pitches here when he's had runners in scoring position than he was earlier in the inning. Two real good fastballs in good locations. Perfect location in under the hand. Now he probably can get him to try to get him to chase something. Breaking ball away. He's a strike away from wriggling out of it here in the third. He wouldn't chase one and two. Did he go after it? He did. He's punched out by Ed Montague. And Hernandez wriggles out of danger. It's a fairly warm evening here. This is Oral Hirschheiser between innings. But as we saw him do in the bullpen before the game and between innings at least once, he's taking bottled water and pouring it over his head. In this case, taking a swig, but pouring it over his head, drenching his hair and neck. And as Davey Johnson of the Orioles and others have said, Oral likes to reach behind his head and pick up some moisture if he can, <laughs> perhaps to affect the flight of the ball. Now, Chad O.J. really stirred things up. He's tomorrow night's pitcher for Cleveland. When he said a few days ago, hey, Oral cheats and everybody else does. Yeah. So what? He taught <laughs> me to cheat. Now, Hershiser, two days later, categorically denied that. Here's counsel, ball one. But, but there are a lot of hitters in the American League and in the National League who have faced Hershiser before who have accused him of throwing a ball that uh, that does funny things. Davy Johnson said he likes to throw a ball that has a little wetness on it in difference to a ball that's dry. And I know one thing it'll make it do funny things Bob when it's wet it really does a ball that's dry or unscuffed isn't going to give you any extra help. You're right. Not only that, he doesn't use those mystery pitches except when he's in <laughs> trouble. And so far, he has not been in trouble, so we haven't seen anything to resemble that mystery pitch that he throws on occasion. A delay as another balloon floats out onto the field, and Grissom picks it up and dunks it over the center field fence. Carl Hershiser. Here's another guy that, like, once he gets into a rhythm, he doesn't he doesn't like to to have things delayed. I mean, once he he, he, he's gotten going. Give me a sign. Stick something down there and let me go. Now is 1-1 one, one pitch to Craig Council. Craig Council has waited long enough and he steps out. He hit 299 in this his rookie year. Came over at midseason from Colorado. One and two. You know, he's talking about Hershiser, Bob, with, with the bottle of water and dumping it all over his head and his neck and everything else. His hat is completely soaked, too. I mean, it doesn't take long for your hat to become soaked with perspiration or water, and you can touch that anywhere, the bill of the cap, any place else to get it. Hit hard and over the bag for possible extra bases. Council sprints around first. Ramirez digs it out of the corner and foul ground, and it's a leadoff double. The first hit of the night off Hershiser. Well, he gets a breaking ball down. Council is able to get enough of it. You see it takes one hand off the bat. That means you're fooled a little bit. But he got good extension on it and pulled it past Tommy. You see they're giving him a lot of the first base line. And he pulls it inside the bag. And right away he's thinking double. And watch this. It's a breaking ball down. He gets out in front of it a little bit. And he hustles it into a double. So Council, with a hit in his first World Series at bat, is now 9 for 20 in this postseason. Lovon Hernandez, a 172 hitter in this his rookie season, will be called upon to bunt. Tommy and Williams inching in. Once it foul. Well, you saw in the Baltimore series they used the wheel play where Matt Williams charged and Vizquel went over to third. 
They were confused there because Vizquel went to third. Williams didn't. But most of the time, you only use the wheel play with the runners at first and second when there's a force out mm -hmm. at third base. But Vizquel broke for third along with Council on that particular pitch. He bunts it out in front of the plate. Hershiser thought about third, now goes to first with Roberts covering. Let's take a look at this gal here, right here. He's at shortstop, and he runs with him to third base. There he goes. Now what that does, that leaves second base open. The first, the second baseman is gone to first base. If this throw gets away, or if he beats it, he can just take off a second because this gal is already over at third. Well, that's twice in postseason that we've seen Hernandez drop down beautiful bunts. In a sacrifice situation, he does it right there. And Cleveland pulls the infield in early. White with a chance to knock home the game-tying run, takes high. There's an area where Hershiser has to stay away from. He wants to come up and inside on Devon White, but you've got to make sure you're really off the inside part on it. No pitch foul back. Both these clubs playing it early as if it's late in the game and playing it as if they fully expect that a run or two could win this game. But neither one of them hit well in the postseason. They played a lot of close ball games, so they feel like we're not going to give up a run easy here in the early innings. Make them earn it and find out who's a little tight tonight. See who's over swinging. That was a good pitch there for Devon White to put in play and hit in the outfield, but he fouled it back. Breaking ball doesn't get the corner. Devon White, Devon White asking Eddie Montague to take a look at that ball. Again, it's put back in play. Hershiser's pitches haven't done anything out of the ordinary yet. Standard fastball and breaking ball, little sinker. Three balls and a strike. This is not a situation where you want to walk him. You have to give him something to hit here because if he gets on first base, it changes the whole inning because Devon White can also steal a base. So it would change the way you have to pitch to Renteria. And he does walk him. Well, the one thing about Hershiser, with a runner in scoring position, he will never give in. Now, the first pitch he threw was up and in. Now, this is a pitch he had to hit right down the middle of the plate, and he fouled it back. Then just off the corner, just off, and even further off on this one. So, he was not about to give in once he fell behind. Now, the infield moves back. Council who doubled to open the inning is at third. White is at first. One out. One nothing Cleveland, bottom of the third. And this opens up a lot of possibilities for Jim Leland. He can hit and run, put the runner in motion, or just let him do a straight steal. Not going, ball one. Renteria, although he hits from the right side, which is a small advantage for Cleveland in this situation, is pretty tough to double if he hits it on the ground. A very speedy runner. Hearing at Rich Donnelly, the coach at third. Tommy Sand on the lines at first for Florida. Cuts and misses one and one. Renneria, here's what you see from Renneria this year. And again, pretty well spaced out. Every once in a while, he'll go to right field. There are big gaps in this ballpark in right and left center. Because of the 345 down the right field line and the left field line at 330, there's big gaps in the outfield. He nubs one down the first baseline. A run is going to score. Renneria making Tommy tag him, which he does. And on a little dribbler, Renneria ties the game. Now Craig Council scores the run to tie this game. And again, Renteria high fives on this little number hit up along the first base side. 
little breaking ball that time from Hershiser. And now watch Jim Tomey. Jim Tomey almost forgot about Devon White. He's going to chase Renneria, tag him, and then chase White back to second base. And here's Council. He's off at the crack of the bat. He's going to score uncontested. This one's tied. Good base running there by Council. He went on contact, and he got a great jump because Tomei was already in, and in a normal circumstance, if he doesn't break wide away, he would have had a chance to throw him out at the plate. So good job there by Council at third base. Now Sheffield with first base open. He never saw a pitch to hit in the first inning, walking on four straight. Called strike. There is his uncle, Dwight Gooden. And he's in a box provided by Sheffield. Gary Sheffield, he said that he said he wanted the Yankees to win. He really wanted the Yankees to win so he could hit against Good. Bounce to third. It comes up for Williams, who throws across and gets him. But a run comes home. And after three, we're tied at one. Back to South Florida. I'm Jim Gray. I'm now joined by Alex Fernandez. He, of course, pitched in the NLCS game two. He had to leave with a partially torn rotator cuff, maybe fully torn. Is it true that when you got better news last week that it may not be career threatening that you went to Jim Leland and said, hey, I want to pitch in the World Series? Yeah, I guess it is true, Jim. It was out of emotion, and uh, I felt that I can do it, but obviously uh, Jim decided my career is too important to uh, risk it at this point. Now, you've been a great cheerleader watching your team and the rest of the NLCS and tonight, but is it just killing you? How difficult is it for you to sit here and watch? Very difficult, obviously, but uh, uh, my health takes prefer preference here, and now I'm going to cheer the guys on as hard as I can. Now, out on the mound tonight, LeVon Hernandez looks up to you quite a bit. What did you tell him before the game, and how have you helped him? Well, really, I haven't, uh, I'm not going to take no credit for it, but Levy, has been a, he's grown up much in the last couple of months, and uh, he's done a wonderful job, and uh, as you well know, he's doing a good job tonight, and I'm hoping the best for him. It was a tremendous, courageous performance. We wish you all the best and hope that the diagnosis continues to be better than what was originally planned. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, Bob, back upstairs to you. Okay, Jim, opening the fourth, LeVon Hernandez falls behind Jim Tomey, who is four for 30 in the postseason. Three and oh. Green light fouls it off. Good idea by Mike Hargrove. What a, a better spot could there be to try to get a guy untracked, let him swing on 3-0, and oh, maybe get a fat one. Yeah, but kind of funny, you bench a guy against the <laughs> left and now you let him hit 3-0. and oh. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, maybe he just missed right. the sign. <laughs> yeah, maybe he blew the sign. <laughs> and he hits this one hard, but right into the glove of Darren Dalton. He scorched it, but Dalton was there. Well, they're lucky he didn't get any elevation on that one. This is something that he hasn't been doing, handling the inside fastball. Now, he gets around on this one and rips it, and Dalton almost got drugged to death on that ball. <laughs> Piece of Watch cake. This. I mean, but that <laughs> is what he normally does. I mean, he turns on the inside fastball. He's been having trouble doing that in the postseason, but he turned on that fastball. Alomar struck out his first time up. Hits the first one to Bonilla at third. And Bobby Bo throws him out. An NBC original event Halloween weekend. Three legends. Grissom bats with two out and nobody on it. Slices one past the lunging Dalton for extra bases. On his way to second as Sheffield gets it back in. A two out double which if nothing else accomplishes this. It gets Hershiser out of the way so the pitcher doesn't lead off in the fifth. Well, this is not a bad pitch by Hernandez. That ball down and away and, and Grissom goes right after it. Watch this. That ball's down and away and hit it past the diving Darren Dalton for the two out double. Not a bad pitch though, but a good piece of hitting. Mike Grissom. So now Hershiser, who struck out to end the second. You can believe the Bulldog is not conceding this at bat. One and one. 
It was early in Hershiser's career when Tommy Lasorda looked him in the eye and said, you know, with that Opie Taylor face and a name like Oral, who's going to take you seriously? From now on, you are the Bulldog. One and two. And he drops a bunt. Hernandez throws to first and gets him. A two-strike bunt almost worked. To the bottom of the four, still tied at one. Keith Olbermann back of the World Series from Miami, and we're going to have to put in those yellow and black safety stripes on the underhang in the Indians' dugout. Oral Hershiser did it again before that last at bat in the fourth inning, just grazed his head going under that uh, overhang. So that's two hits for Oral Hershiser and only one for the Marlins. Bob? <laughs> and the Bulldog establishing an unofficial World Series record for self inflicted dome dents here in game one. And as we so start through the order, the middle of this order, the second time around, see Vanier there, he laid off of that change up down. He has been swinging at everything Hershey has been throwing him down. Make him get the ball up is going to be their theme this inning. I guarantee that. It's their second time around. They've seen him. They know what to expect. 2-0 to Bonilla, who struck out to end the first. 3-0. Again, Joe, when you look at Bonilla and, and look at the Indians outfield, and the way Hershiser is, is pitching him and trying to stay away, but every once in a while he comes inside him and the outfield is shifted way around towards left. Walks him on four pitches. The third walk tonight issued by Hershiser. This is Bobby Bonilla. Go ahead, you. And that last play that, uh, that Bonilla handled in the championship series where he pulled a hamstring. He slightly pulled. It wasn't a full pull, and uh, we talked to the Marlins after the game about that, and Bonilla said, slight pull, everything's okay. And when you slightly pull a muscle, what happens if you have to run like from first to home, or you run a long way, the longer you run, the more tired the muscle gets, and that's when you pull it. So he still has to be very careful. Now Dalton, the one-time All-Star who went to the World Series with the 93 Phillies, Hit 14 home runs while batting 263 between Philadelphia and Florida this year. Fly to deep center his first time up. Smart play by the Cleveland Indians. They're playing behind Bonilla at first base, trying to close that hole between Tommy and Bip Roberts. One and one. Only this handful of Marlins have World Series experience. Dalton and Ice and Ripe with the Phils, White and Lighter with the Blue Jays. Hit toward the hole, Roberts lunges, stops it. Who's going to cover it? Nobody. At least not in time. Hershiser got over there late. Well, the fact that he was playing back and off the base hurt them there because he act. Tommy went after the ball, and Hershiser didn't get there. If Tommy's playing his normal position, he doesn't go after this ball. See how far he's getting off? Look at that. He's getting way off the back, so that allows him to chase it. Now he can't get back. So that defensive alignment really hurt them more than it helped them. See how far off the bag he is? And watch, he chases the ball. He's almost at second base. Now there's no way for him to get back. Hershiser does not get there in time, so now they have runners at first and second. With their leading RBI man for the season at the plate, Alou knocked home 115, but both of these managers are handling this game as if they were Gene Mock playing for the single run early, playing little ball. Would you consider letting a little lay one down here? Well, you know, I, I think little ball, Bob, is because of the fact that neither one of these clubs has has, has scored in the postseason. I mean, the, the Indians won because of pitching against Baltimore. They were out hit. They were outscored in that series. The bullpen won the four games for them. And here, I mean, they're playing for a run. They're playing for the double play here. They're playing back. But, uh, I mean, in, in this situation, I think I got to let Alou go. Another balloon floats out and is popped before Roberts can retrieve it. Well, you're not going to have Alou bunting in this situation because he led your team and runs batted in. And you see first ball hitter, he swung at the first pitch. He will chase some fastballs up and away, and you have to throw him a lot of breaking balls. 
hits the 0-1 pitch foul. Another consideration, not only despite his postseason slump, is Alou your top RBI man for the year, but after him, you're working toward the bottom of the order. You know, he hit a couple of balls in the postseason against the Braves in that series. As you look at Charles Johnson, he's due next. That were caught, but he hit him well. And he was bothered by that wrist injury. We saw him injure the wrist in a play in Atlanta trying to catch a home run ball. Injuring his wrist on the top of the wall in Atlanta. The 0 2 pitch hit deep to left. If it's fair, it's a three run homer. It's out of here. It hit the foul pole. And the Marlins grab a 4 1 lead. Sacrifice? What sacrifice? It's a bad pitch from her side. You have an 0 2 count. Look at this pitch. It's a strike. He was trying to get something away from Alou, an off speed pitch, maybe, and, but he didn't get it away. Alou went out and got it and pulled it over the left field wall, right down the line. Fair ball. And again, when we talked about the sacrifice, it's so tough. To have your top guy, your RBI guy, up there sacrificing in that situation, he got the pitch up and hit it out of here. One and one to Charles Johnson. When her size against you and two, usually he makes you fish for something, but he made a good pitch, a threw a strike. That is that that is very on oral Hershiser's right there. I mean, two strikes and then a pitch right down the middle. I mean, for a guy to get that kind of wood on it and to be able to pull it that way, turn it around to the left side is a big, big mistake. I mean, you just don't see him do that that often. If at all. And now this ball is belted. Back to back. actually a changeup and Johnson gets out in front of it and drills it. I could see it was an off speed pitch and her side of the new as soon as he hit it that one was gone and it wasn't about to curve foul. I mean they just want to look in the dugout and see how far it's going. I'll That's lose up in that. Mark McGuire territory. <laughs> I'll lose says I can do the same thing. I could have hit it that far if I wanted to. What a blast by Johnson. And another mistake by her side or a high changeup. Council bounces one to Tommy. And there is the first out in the bottom of the fourth. Well, the walk to Bonilla to lead off. Dalton with that infield single. And then the three run blast. Well, I really think the defensive line that they played with Bonilla at first base really hurt them. Roberts makes a great play, but he has no one to throw it to. Now Hernandez. He swings on the first pitch and pops it up. Williams backs up and in fair ground makes the catch. A little concern to Hernandez, who now has been staked to a 5-1 lead. I'll tell you, there's another mistake. Ryan Anderson in the bullpen now for the Indians. That was another mistake by Hershiser. He got away with one on, on Hernandez, who took a good whack and popped it up. High fastball. Devon White bats with two out and nobody on, but four runs home in the bottom of the fourth. We're waiting for the estimate on the distance for the Charles Johnson home run. A titanic shot into the upper deck. Mark McGuire and 
Andres Galarraga hit balls into the upper deck were a little farther. They were all in left center field. And they were estimated at over 500 feet. Well, the Marlins toyed with the Gene Mock approach, and in this inning, they went with the Earl Weaver approach, the three-run homer, and then a solo back-to-back -back for good measure. You're right, pitching, defense, and the three-run homer. That's Earl Weaver's favorite line. You know, Hershiser, when he uh, when he tried to bunt for a base hit and really busted down the line, it may have taken something out of him. Here in the bottom half of the inning, it was the third out in the inning. He went to the dugout and stayed in there a long time before he came out to get himself toweled down a little bit. And here in the bottom half of the inning, gives up two home runs and that mammoth job by Johnson. And the Marlins out in front here now. He has he has really not made pitches tonight, Joe. I mean, he did it in the first couple of innings, but he missed on a couple of pitches that he wanted to put downstairs, inside or outside. They just stayed up on him, hung up there, and they were hit hard. Very hard. His 2 2 pitch to White. In the air to left, and this is also well hit, but backing up is Justice to the edge of the track for the catch. Four runs in the fourth. First to Lou. Off the foul pole. And then Johnson hit one halfway to Clearwater. Perhaps shell shocked Oral Hirschheiser rocked for back to back home runs by Moises Alou and then Charles Johnson. The Marlins hit only one home run. Gary Sheffield had it in the six games of the NLCS against the Atlanta Braves. Two big ones here in game one. Well, he hasn't made pitches tonight, Bob. He did earlier in the game in the first couple of innings. But uh, in that fourth inning, bottom half, he got two up one on Alou and one on Johnson, and they hit him out of here. Suddenly trailing by four. The Indians come up in the fifth with their leadoff man, Bip Roberts. He's doubled twice. Takes high. With the lead, they go for defense. Dalton out, Conine in at first. Two and oh. Well, we know enough about the Indians to know that they're not out of this contest by any means down by four. Well they squandered a big lead in game one of the division series against the Yankees then overcame a big deficit in game two. Two one pitch. Misses. Well that's where Hernandez has got to stay. He's given up a couple of doubles to Roberts. Both on pitches inside. First a changeup, then a fastball around the inside part. Both hit to right field. One reason for the Conine substitution is both of these teams advanced because of solid defense, good fundamentals, and consistent relief pitching. And they want to put the best defense they can put on the field now that they have a five to one lead. Three two pitch. Hernandez somehow came up with that ball. We saw him make a couple of dandy plays against the Braves, but that's the best one we've seen him make yet. Now this this is a bullet hit back through the middle by Pip Roberts on a low fastball. Watch the reaction of Hernandez. This ball is really smoked. Down he goes. He's got it. There's the throw and Roberts is gone. What a play by Hernandez. One more look. Low fastball. He hit it right back through the box. Down he goes to make the pickup and then an easy throw. And a lot of down play on a ball that was really hit. Boy, you got to be something of a contortionist to make that play. Or 22 years old. <laughs> Vizquel with a shot foul. He's sacrificed and lined to right. Well, he's always in good fielding position. He made a great catch in game five, the line drive back through the middle. So he stays in good fielding position. He doesn't fall off to the first base side like a lot of right handed pitchers do. Two balls and a strike. Wouldn't it be something if Hernandez, in his first two postseason starts, beat first Greg Maddox and then Oral Hirschheim? Oral, 8 and 1 for his career in the postseason. 
Renteria. One shortstop throws out another, and two of the game's best will be featured in this World Series, Vizquel and Renteria. Tomorrow, following an NFL doubleheader on NBC Game 2 of this series, with coverage beginning at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific, from right here at Pro Player Stadium. Scheduled pitchers, Chad O.J. for the Indians, and Kevin Brown, the Marlins' ace, will go. Ramirez has walked twice. Fouled off. Untold riches await Levon Hernandez here in the States. He's collected some of them already. Meanwhile, his half brother Orlando works as a physical therapist, we're told, in Cuba for 206 pesos a month, which is about 10 bucks. Orlando is one of the eight players and coaches banned from Cuban baseball for counter-revolutionary activity because they fear or suspect that he tried to defect. One of those is the great shortstop Herman Mesa, who if he were in the big leagues would probably be one of the five or six best shortstops in American baseball. In the air to deep left off Ramirez's bat. This is going to turn Alou into a spectator. Long gone. As soon as he touched it off, Alou knew it was leaving the yard. He didn't so much as turn. Well, one of the things I said before was the curveball is not as effective against these Indian right-handed hitters as the hard slider is. You can get them to chase pitches because they have to commit quicker. Ramirez uses a pretty heavy bat. He waits back on this curveball, and I mean he hammers it, hits it off the facing of the upper deck. See, that's an overhand curveball, and it just sits there and says, "Hit me." And Ramirez does more than that. He pounds it off the face of the upper deck. The slider will be more effective. He better use the slider, not too many curveballs. And Hernandez knew it. He could have hit that with a broomstick. I mean, that thing hung up there and said, hit me as you said, Joe. That's the Indians one get one back. Ball. Excuse me, Bob, that he's throwing it up. And trail now five to two. Ramirez had 26 of them during the regular season. This is his third in the postseason. Justice lifts one behind second base. Council back on the outfield grass for the catch. The homer by Ramirez makes it 5-2 as we go to the bottom of the fifth. Big day tomorrow. NFL doubleheader. The Raiders. And that runs almost seamlessly into game two of the World Series. A fish out of water is Billy Marlin, but apparently possessing amphibious qualities. Everybody's doing the fish. That's their theme song here. You wake up and see him in your room in the morning, then you've got a problem. Here he's all right. Especially if you're Luca Brazzi. <laughs> Hershiser to Renteria. Left fielder, Dodgers, 39. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Five to Florida as they bat in the fifth. A shot to short. Vizquel plays with it a little bit and returns the favor as Renteria had thrown him out just a moment ago. Now coming up for most of you after the game, it'll be your late local news followed by an all new Saturday Night Live with guest host Brendan Frazier. But for those of you who want to stick with us for more coverage from here, Keith Olbermann and Hannah Storm have the World Series post game show immediately following the game on CNBC. Sheffield has walked and grounded a third. Unlike most of his teammates, Oral Hershiser is not unfamiliar with this ballpark. In fact, he was the losing pitcher in the first game ever played by the Florida Marlins. The Dodgers were the opponent here in April of 1993, and Hershiser was beaten on opening night by Charlie Huff. What was the score? I don't Six know. Six to three. Was it? Yes. You check that out. Yeah, no, I'm just making stuff up to go along with you. <laughs> Yeah, but my part is true, you understand. No, it was six to three. We'll check it to make sure. It was six to three. We get a yes from our gallery behind us. Six to three. 
Thank you very much, guys. Whether it was six to three or not, thanks a lot. <laughs> now that that mystery has been cleared up, <laughs> much to the relief of the American public, three and one is the count to Sheffield. That's what Sheffield's needed all day today. He's been hurt. Relief. Playing with a severe stomach virus that almost kept him out of the lineup. Only on deck. Hirschheiser working very deliberately here in the fifth. Full count. He came back with a three and one breaking ball. He wasn't going to give in to Gary Sheffield. I think Sheffield's been surprised twice by him tonight, Joe, throwing breaking balls right down the middle, and he's taking them both. They check at first base, but Dale Ford says he didn't go around, so he walks for the second time tonight. Bonilla to the plate, and we go to Jim Gray. All right, Bob, well, in between innings, Bobby Bonilla had his left hamstring retaped by trainer Larry Starr. Starr came over and told me that it has tightened up a bit on Bonilla, but he is feeling okay. Bonilla told him he has so much adrenaline in his body, he doesn't want to come out of the game, so he will continue. Bob? Now Mark Wiley, the pitching coach, trudges toward the mound to talk with Hirschheiser and Alomar out from behind the plate. We have two fine shortstops here. One is very flashy, Vizquel. The other one is a classic shortstop. Watch this ground ball that Hirschheiser throws to Renteria. Now watch how Vizquel feels it. I mean, he has a little flash to him. Look at that. Pitches it up in the air, takes it, and throws. That's a one way of transferring the ball from your glove to your hand. Renteria, more of a classic shortstop. He would have reached in and picked it out, but Vizquel, gold glove winner. He does things with a flash, but very entertaining. And there's a comparison of the two guys. Went to risk 17 errors. Look at that. Although you have to realize this is on his second year in the majors, whereas Vizquel has been here for a while, nine years, and I guarantee you when Renteria gets into his ninth season, we're going to be talking about him as one of the great shortstops in baseball. He is so fundamentally sound, knows how to play the game, and he's a hard worker. Bonilla has struck out and walked. Sheffield, who was nearly picked off back in the first, dives back safely. Hirschheiser trailing 5 2 in the fifth. Works to Bonilla, who rips it to right for a hit. Sheffield to second, makes the turn, heads for third as Ramirez gets it back to the infield. Runners at the corners with one out. And Bob, all this started the second time around for the middle of this order. They had seen Hirschheiser, and they felt like Bobby Mill started by not chasing pitches, so he waits. Now he gets a pitch to hit. That's what you have to do. Prove to Hirschheiser you're not going to go out of the strike zone to help him. He will give you some pitches to hit. This is a little slider up, and he just rips it to right field for a base hit. Sheffield heads up, heads around the third because Ramirez is playing so deep he doesn't have a chance to throw him out. So the second time through this order, the middle of this order became a problem for Hirschheiser, and that's where it's going to have to get done anyway, the middle of this order. Now Conine's first at bat. He replaced Dalton after they took the 5-1 lead. And a called strike. Speaking of that first ever Marlins game where Huff beat Hirschheiser, Conine, one of two original Marlins left. Alex Arias, a reserve infielder, is the other. Conine had four hits that day. One and one. The right-hander Jeff Juden gets up in Mike Hargrove's bullpen. Hirschheiser trying to keep it reasonably close. He and his team already trail by three. Conine taps it foul. Conine was an expansion draft selection prior to that first season for the Marlins, taken off the Kansas City roster, one time All Star. This year, beneath his usual standards, he hit 242, but he did have 17 home runs. 
and he got a huge game winning hit off Greg Maddox in game five last Sunday here in the LCS. Two and two. You mentioned he got a huge hit off Maddox in game five but you have to give Jim Leland a lot of credit for that also a lot of people were looking for Conine to bunt and Maddox gave him a pitch to hit and he hit it back through the middle so good strategy there by Jim Leland if there's a book of baseball strategy you would think judging by this postseason that Jim Leland has not read it in on his hands and rolled foul I mean he has made some unconventional moves and the vast majority of them have panned out well he, he told us he said you can take the book and you can take records and everything else and throw them out the window when you get into short series like this. He said, I never go by the book. He said, I, I go by what my I feel my players can do in a game against a certain pitcher. I mean, look at Sheffield. Sheffield has not hit well in postseason at all, but he's walked 14 times and he's been a key factor in some of these runs that have been scored. He's at third. Bonilla is at first with one out. And Conine fouls it off. Good job by Conine to stay alive there. He's just trying to put this ball in play, and he needs to put it in play because that run is very important. It gets them back to a four run lead, which obviously makes it a grand slam before they can be tied. So important that he try to get this run home. And he's battling Hershiser, just trying to put the ball in play. Hershiser at age 39, laboring in game one of the World Series. Trailing 5 2. And another foul ball. Oh, Hershiser giving no indication of the uh, of retirement, Bob. He said he wants to come back next year. He said he wants to pitch in Cleveland again. He he, uh, he thought it over and, and thought about it for a long time. He still feels that he can pitch and help the Indians, and that's where he wants to finish his career next year and maybe a year after that. As a sign from Alomar, another 2-2 pitch. Lying to center. Not hit hard, but in a good spot. It drops. And it's 6-2 Florida as Sheffield trots across. And that's excellent hitting on the part of Conan. He shortened his swing, and he just tried to put the ball in play, and he hits a little line drive to the center field, and he gets the job done. With two strikes, he shortened his swing, fighting the ball off the right field, and he finally got a pitch that he could handle. And he hits this little line drive to center field. Watch. Look at that. Real short swing. He's just trying to put the ball in play. Good job there by Conine. Hershiser is done. Leaves on the short end of a 6 2 score. And we'll be back to South Florida in a moment. When this season began, the Indians probably expected Jack McDowell to be their horse, the ace of their staff. He went down in May out for the year. They added John Smiley late in the year. He breaks his arm while warming up just prior to the playoffs. He's done. They pursued Roger Clemens and Alex Fernandez, who signed here in Florida as free agents. Tried to trade for the Phillies' Kurt Schilling. Couldn't land any of them. Jeff Juden in the game. Alou swings on the first one. Viscal gets the force to Roberts, who might have come off the bag. Oh, man. But they give him the call. Man, I, I think he call. was barely in the vicinity of second base he wasn't when anywhere he took that throw. Excuse me, Bob. He wasn't anywhere near the bag. Roberts is way off the bag when he takes this throw from Viscal. Watch this. He looked like he was off the bag when he took that throw from Vizquel. Here it is again, deep in the hole. He makes the play. He, he looks like he came off the bag before the runner ever got there. But not as far there on the replay as it looked the to the naked eye. You get a different angle on it, and it looks like he was off the bag a little bit further than he actually was. Strike one from Juden to Johnson. Here again, Vizquel now from deep in the hole gets off a good throw to Roberts. Who really looked like he came off the bag. He was off the bag. Again, blocked by the umpire on that view. But it looked like he came off the bag way in, way in front of that runner getting there. But a force at second, that's all that counts. I don't think half the guys are on the bag anyway when you take that throw. And I don't think people tag you on steal attempts at second either. Leaving runners now at first and third with two out. A 
and Charles Johnson who hit one of the longest home runs he's ever hit his last time up following a three run shot by Moises Alou off the foul pole he launched one into the upper deck to make it five to one it's six two now in favor of the Marlins as they bat in the fifth six foot eight inch Jeff Juden brings it home two and one Juden was 0 and one for the year his ERA was almost six that's with Cleveland began the year with the Expos where he went 11 and five finishing up the thought on the Indians search for additional starting pitching depth John Hart their general manager hasn't disguised his intentions he says this offseason even if they win the World Series he's going after Pedro Martinez of the Expos likely National League Cy Young Award winner. Well, Rounded foul, full count. He'll definitely have company. <coughs> he lost 15 him. other guys, yeah. 15 other clubs, or more. Unusual for a pitcher to have a number like seven. That's an outfielder or a first baseman's number. Juden is a little unusual <laughs> in that, you know, he has great stuff. He's always had great stuff. Three-two pitch. Bounces away, and a run is going to come home on ball four. That makes it seven to two. This this looked like a splitter that Juden just overthrew. I mean, he tried to throw this split-fingered fastball 90 plus miles an hour. This ball bounced way in front of Alomar, all the way back to the screen. Here it is again. That ball hit in front of home plate. Alomar almost in self-defense, trying to keep it from taking him apart. There you see it bouncing back toward the fence, and the runner from third scores easily. There's Bobby Bonilla. No problem scoring on this one, and the Marlins add one more. Also charged to Hershiser. Now Council. Fastball high. Look at the way Alomar <laughs> caught that one. Yikes. If you squat down and you hold that target down there too long and you're looking for something around the knees or around the waist, watch this one. You got to get up in a hurry. And a good play by Alomar to save a wild pitch. 2 and 0 to Council, who's doubled and grounded out. Bonilla just scored the seventh run. Now talks it over with Leland. Let it go right here. Swing it, they were together for division winning seasons in Pittsburgh in 90 and 91. Bonilla was gone to the Mets before the 92 Pirate LCS against the Braves. 3 and 0 now. Bonilla made an interesting comment. He said, you know, I've been in the league 12 years trying to get to the World Series. He said, I'm happy I'm here, but the thing I'm most happy about is that I'm going there with Jim Leland because they have a very close relationship. They played together. And I remember when Bobby Bonilla left Pittsburgh. You know, Jim Leland said, you know, he was going to miss his personality. I'm getting the fact of all the home runs he hits, the runs he drove in, but he was a very good guy to have on his ball club. And a called strike. I don't know that the Elias Sports Bureau keeps official records on this sort of thing, but this might be the greatest combined height for a battery in big league history six eight pitcher six five catcher full count to counsel of course Randy Johnson and just about anybody would be a contender Johnson at 610 tallest in big league history but you don't see too many catchers six five like Sandy Alamo Johnson would be a contender with anyone but me and you yeah, that would take the average down considerably. It's <laughs> Charles Johnson. The Marlins no small guy either. The runners go, and the 3-2 pitch is nearly another wild pitch on ball four. You see, uh, you see Alomar there hollering out at Juden, come on, let's go. And Mark Wiley coming out to find out what's going on here. This is another fastball from Juden. He almost threw this one over Alomar's head. Look at this. Way off the outside corner, and Alomar up to pull that one down to save another wild pitch. You know, Alomar actually, saying, he's saying, come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let's go. 
Actually, you come kind of disappointed in your call of that pitch. That was just a bit inside. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking you out. Come on, will you? Being so serious. <laughs> So Hargrove and Wiley figure that Juden should be able to get Hernandez out. But the way the last couple of innings have gone for the Indians, nothing is a certainty. He sacrificed and popped out. Backs out of the box and takes a ball, as if to say, prove to me you can throw a strike. With the bases loaded, now would be a good time for Juden to do that. And there it is. I mean, you, you, you've got to say to yourself here, and, and being Alamore or Juden, I mean, take three fastballs and throw them right down the pipe. I mean, forget about the breaking ball or the splitter or anything else. Swings and hits it hard, but at the scale. To first, they leave the bases loaded, but they score two more. And after five, they lead by five. Trailing by five, Cleveland will send Matt Williams, Jim Tomey, and Sandy Alomar to the plate in the top half of the sixth. Williams is 0 for 2. A lot more breathing room for LeVon Hernandez now. Than he had against Greg Maddox six days ago. Bonilla takes it on the short hop and guns Matt Williams out. A lot has been said about Bonilla's deficiencies at third base, but we've seen him play an excellent third base in the postseason. I mean, I've never seen him play better than he's playing right now. I mean, this is a tough hop. Now, watch, he does the right thing, he shortens it, takes it on the short hop. He didn't run away from it, he came right to it, took it on the short hop, and makes a perfect throw. Jim Tomey has now gone 74 at bats dating to mid-September without a home run. Hit a blur down to first base his last time up but it was caught by Darren Dalton who has since been replaced there by Jeff Conine. You notice that Tomey wears his socks high and they say he went around. Greg Koska at third base with the call. Tomey wearing the socks high like old time players and now virtually all the Indians are doing the same. On his birthday, August 27th, as kind of a gag, a mock tribute to him, they all hoisted their socks up. They scored 10 runs that night, and they've stuck with it as a result. You know, years ago, Bob, there was a rule. Ball clubs had rules. You had to wear your pants at a certain height, depending on... In the air to left, this ball is well hit. Alou is going back, and... It clears the scoreboard for a home run. Alou was trying to decoy him into breaking into a trot on the off chance that it hit the top of the wall and it was still in play. And it did not clear that scoreboard by very much. And there is the first home run for Jim Tomey in the postseason and since mid-September to the opposite field where many of his home runs go. Well, talked earlier about Tomey and his power to all field. Here's an outside fastball from Hernandez. He goes right with it, and he hit it out of here and left. He can do it to any part of the ballpark. It's been a long time for Tomey. Bob, you said it just cleared the wall out there, and it did. But to finish up that thought on the socks, clubs had a rule. You had to wear your pants at a certain level on your leg, calf high, whatever, depending on what kind of socks you wore to show stripes. Seven to three now. And two and one to Alamon. Reaches for it. Weak swing. Two and two. Dennis Cook, a former Indian. Of course, there are a lot of formers on his resume. He's been with six or seven different big league clubs. He begins to warm up for Florida. Full count now to Alamon. Both clubs have two home runs. But Ramirez and Tomey were both solo for the Indians. Alou had a three-run shot for the Marlins, followed 
by a solo homer off the bat of Charles Johnson. Now a one out single for Alamar. He's one for three and while Hernandez still leads and comfortably it would appear he's nowhere close to as sharp as he was in the game we saw six days ago against Atlanta and the curveball isn't working for him like it was that night. He doesn't have command of the curveball and he hasn't thrown nearly as many of them since the first inning. Here's the Hernandez reaction on the home run driven to the opposite field by Tommy. Now as we come back live he's talking with the pitching coach Larry Rothschild. He was upset but I don't sometimes you have to give the hitter credit for hitting a good pitch. He tried to get him inside the time before with a fastball and he pulled it to the first baseman Dalton so he tried to go away this time and he hit it over the wall so you have to give the hitter some credit he hit both sides of the plate he covered both sides on the pitches you threw so you have to think about just getting the next hitter out that guy made a good swing. Grissom has struck out and doubled. The Indians trying to peck away here in the sixth, and this will help them do it. Base hit through the left side. Now they'll go to their bench, and Jeff Branson will pinch hit. Your attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, Hernandez struck out 15 the last time we saw him. Tonight, he has four strikeouts, including striking out the side in the second inning. And he's walked a couple. Now you talked about the breaking stuff for Hernandez tonight, Bob. That last pitch hit by Grissom was a curveball that hung up high, and he went out and got it and knocked it to left field. So Brent's on the former Red, who hit 264 off the Cleveland bench. Stands in with one out and two on. And a run already home. Ball one. The Indians have eight hits off Hernandez. In there, one and one. Alomar is at second. Grissom is at first. They each single. Branson cuts and misses one and two. Branson just asked the home plate umpire Eddie Montague inside or not. Won the bad pitch around the inside corner. Cleveland with a chance to get back into it here in the sixth. out of play. Tony Fernandez game six hero stretching just in case. Full workout. Getting some aerobic work in. Another foul. Well, Hernandez with a couple of fastballs. On Branson inside that one away. Let's see if he goes down and inside with a breaking ball here with that curveball or slider off the inside. Another one two pitch called strike three. Well he's throwing some good fastballs under the hands. Breaking ball starts away and then he goes breaking ball for a strike. Back under the hands with a good fastball. Another one in the same spot. He fouls it off. And he fouls off enough. Here's the breaking ball. Backdoor breaking ball catches the outside corner for strike three. Well, now you have Bip Roberts coming up, who has doubled twice, and the one time he was retired, he hit the ball like a shot right back at Hernandez. So Leland will pull him here and bring on Dennis Cook, and we'll step aside for just a moment. Levon Hernandez. 
Hernandez exits leading seven to three but as you're about to see he is less than completely satisfied. And this is what he leaves in his wake. First aid kit. Equipment trunk overturned on the way to the clubhouse. John Cangelosi was among those who followed him up the steps to try and calm him down. I guess those guys ought to feel good that he didn't start his drive raid when he came into the into the dugout in amongst all those players. Dennis Cook comes on. Roberts turns around to the right side and fouls the first one off. Cook has been very effective in this postseason. Five and two thirds scoreless innings. He had two separate tours with the Indians. In fact after he was sent to the White Sox several Indians suspected that it was Cook who tipped the White Sox off to the possibility that Albert Bell was corking his bat. Remember they confiscated the bat it started a big brouhaha. Cook vehemently denied it. The 0 1 and he gets ahead of Roberts 0 and 2. A base hit here could make things very interesting. It's 7 3 Florida. A run home on Tommy's homer. Two men on with two out. Alomar at second, Grissom at first. Mike Hargrove told us before the game that he was a little bit hesitant in his first World Series. A lot of gut feelings that he had he didn't act upon in 95 against the Braves. Quicker to pull the trigger on a strategic move in this postseason. Very daring against the Yankees and especially the Orioles. Here's the 0 2. Cook delivers on one and two. Two balls and two strikes to Bip Roberts. A futile check at first. Dale Ford says no. Jay Powell, hard throwing right hander. You can hear him make the glove pop as he warms up. And Felix Heredia, the left hander. Two on, two out, and the 2 2 pitch. In the air to right. And this should end it. Sheffield backs up to take it. They score one, they leave two. Middle of the sixth, 7 3 Florida. Baseball's acting commissioner, Bud Selig, in attendance. One of the perks of the job is an excellent box seat. Wayne Heisinga, the owner of the Marlins, the Panthers, the Dolphins for that matter, all three in action tomorrow, and the great golfer, Ray Floyd. And Don Shula, one of Ray Floyd's closest friends, they spent a lot of time golfing and traveling together with their wives and families since Shula retired as coach of the Dolphins. Pro football's all-time winningest coach and one of sports' all-time best guys, Don Shula. Eric Plunk now to the mound for Cleveland. Asked to keep it only a four-run deficit as the Marlins bat on the sixth. White, Renteria, and Sheffield do. Throws very hard. Down and in, and White skips away. Now that one got away from Plunk, and so did his footing. But as you said, Bob, he's a hard thrower. Good breaking stuff. Splitter. The guy, another guy who I always thought, you know, for as hard as he threw and as well as he pitched, has moved around. Yankees, Oakland A's, now the Indians. Two balls and no strikes to White, who's 0 for 2 with a walk. Sheffield, under the weather in a big way tonight, with a stomach virus, but still in the lineup. It's possible 
it's possible as he just told our Jim Gray moments ago and Jim is in the vicinity of the dugout that he's feeling very weak possible that they would take him out after his at bat in this inning yeah even if uh, even if he doesn't reach Bob you're right but uh, if he does reach especially then would they take Sheffield out. Here's an item of interest home field advantage as you know means less in baseball than in any other team sport doesn't mean nothing it just isn't as significant an advantage as in football basketball or hockey. There's the three one. Hopped up on the infield. Escal and Williams Omar wants it for the first out. Still you would think especially with the DH used in the National League parks and not in the American League Park that it would be an advantage not to be sneezed at or sneered at. And yet there have been 544 World Series games played most of them of course before the advent of the DH in 92 different World Series coming into this year 544 games the home team has won 273 the visitors 271 absolutely no difference well if, when you get to this time of the season you have the best teams playing and they usually have good road records as well as good home records so they're capable of winning on the road and I think that's the difference. Lenteria is 0 for 3 and Vizquel will now make him 0 for 4. So four of the seven games if it goes the distance will be here on the Marlins home field. We'll see if that makes a difference. Let's take a look at Sheffield's three previous at bat. He walks in his first at bat. He had a sinker that he grounded to third baseman Matt Williams. And he walked in the fifth inning because Hersheiser didn't want to give him anything to hit. Well, he's gutted it out tonight through five plus, batting for the fourth time and and really under the weather. Strike one to him with two out and nobody on. Well, he was looking for one of those Dwight Gooden fastballs there, and he got a breaking ball from Plunk. a strike although he hit only 250 for the year Sheffield hit at a 324 clip in September and for the postseason he entered this game hitting 346 with a couple of home runs plus 14 postseason walks now on the corner one and two well, there's a pitch that Sheffield in order to hit is really going to have to drive to right field around or just off the outside corner. That distinctive twitching of the bat, generating all kinds of bat speed. Swings and misses, goes down on strikes, and we'll see if he's still in the field when we move to the seventh. We're back after these messages from your local station. Biggest crowd ever to see a baseball game involving the Florida Marlins. They opened up some seats that previously had been used only for football. With Marlin Mania gripping South Florida after the division series sweep against the Giants and then disposing of the Braves in six. We don't have the official attendance yet, but it will be a record. Dennis Cook works to Omar Vizquel, Matty Ramirez, and David Justice in the seventh. Both of these teams' bullpens have been exceptional, especially down the stretch. And Jim Leland calls on Dennis Cook who has done a great job for the Marlins this year and they're set up now so that they can work their way to Rob Nin, their closer. Quickly 0 and 2 to Vizquel who's 0 for 2 with a sacrifice tonight. Both of these teams bullpens did a great job. I mean the Cleveland Indians bullpen won all of their games against Baltimore. Talking about the bullpen, the Marlins bullpen is busy again. I talked to Nen tonight before the game. I said, "How you feel?" He said, "I feel great, man. I'm, you know, we got four more to go, four more to win, and it's over. If it takes a whole week to do it, he said, I feel great. I'm ready." Still 0 and 2.
Al Leiter, something of a cut up throughout his career. Zany hijinks with the sidelined Alex Fernandez. Max Patkin. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Euchre. <laughs> hey, who's kidding who here? Another 0-2 pitch. Foul back. In addition to being the team that reached the World Series fastest in this the fifth year of their existence, the Marlins are obviously also the first wild card team ever to make it as far as the World Series. The merits of that system have been and will be debated. But in fairness to the Marlins, they had the second best record in the National League after the Braves, and they hammered the Braves head to head 12 out of 18, and they played with skill and heart, especially in the postseason. So whether you agree with the system or not, there's no denying that the Marlins are a good team. There is their owner. What a day for him tomorrow. He's going to watch his Panthers play an afternoon game in person, come to the ballpark here, and watch the Dolphins play on television they're on the road obviously since this is their home park and then game two of the World Series what a triple header for South Florida and especially for Wayne Huizenga who virtually owns the state yeah I was just going to say if you own all three clubs it's really not that hard to take great group of toys to play oh right? yeah you got that right Joe his Panthers reached the Stanley Cup finals in only the third year of their existence so quick success is not new to him here are the Marlins in year five Two and two to Vizquel. Cook trying to protect the 7 3 lead for Hernandez, and Vizquel making him work. You know, the, the Indians, after coming off that, that emotional series against Baltimore, uh, you know, maybe feeling the effects of that right now. Marlins, big series against the Braves, and a series that they weren't picked to win. And and uh, and won it and won it on the road. Won it in Atlanta. And finally, Cook takes care of Vizquel. One out on the Cleveland seven. Coming in two weeks on NBC. Speaking of the Atlanta. In the Marlins series, I thought Ryan Klesko put it best. He said, "We outpitched them, we outhit them, but we did not outplay them." Mm -hmm. And I think that was the key to that series. The Marlins played so well, did not make any mistakes, and the Cleveland Indians did the same thing against the Baltimore Orioles. They yep. took advantage of mistakes made by the Orioles, and the Marlins took advantage of mistakes made by the Atlanta Braves. So here are the Indians with just 86 victories fewest victories of the four playoff qualifiers in the American League but peaking in the playoffs and they find themselves in the World Series only one team has ever won the World Series with fewer victories over a 162 game season that was the 87 twins who won 85 only one other team ever made it to the World Series with fewer victories in a 162 game season that was the 73 Mets who lost in seven to the Oakland A's in the year Minnesota did it they were the fifth best team in the American League uh, win and loss record. Yeah, they were first in the West, but as a function of the balanced schedule, which has never made much sense, they were able to get in. Well, three different clubs who had better records in the East were out of the playoffs. And now Ramirez drives one to deep right. Back to the track goes Sheffield to take it. Manny had homered his last time up, gave this one a ride, but he's retired for the second out on the seventh. Well, no matter what you say about the Indians, they beat the Yankees and they beat the Orioles to get here, and and that's that's all that counts. Gary Sheffield retrieving glove out in in right field. Another guy thought maybe Jim Leland might lift him after that last A.B., but Sheffield's still in the game and obviously wants to stay in the game. You know, we talked to Jim Leland tonight, Bob, and and talked Not about. The emotions of of, uh, of winning and and getting to the World Series, he said, "Hey, I don't want nothing." He said, "This belongs to the players." He said, "Everything that's happened this year was because of the players. They're the ones that deserve it, deserve all the credit, and should enjoy it." He said, "I'm just a little part of it." But the players say the same thing about him, mm -hmm. and they're all happy for Jim. There's not a more candid guy around. 
<laughs> no, he'll level with you. He won't give up the information gratuitously, but if you ask a no, question, he will level with you. Justice singled for a one nothing Cleveland lead in the first. That's long since disappeared. Since then, he's popped out twice. 2-0. David Justice, not a routine out against left-handed pitchers. David Justice hits left-handed pitchers as well as anybody. Just ask Mike Hargrove. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. He left Jim Poole in to pitch to David Justice in game six in Atlanta. And Justice was with the Braves, and he homered off the lefty Poole for the only run in a one-nothing game six series clinching victory. A 2-0 -oh from Cook is high. In fact, Hargrove told us now that Justice has been my player and I've seen him day in day out for a full season I realize what a good breaking ball hitter he is and if I'd known that I wouldn't have let Poole who doesn't throw as hard as some other guys I had in to face him I would have brought in a right hander even who threw harder mm -hmm. all you've got to do on Justice is watch his front foot against left hand you don't see that front foot flying out towards first base he's going right into the pitch all the time I mean unless I mean unless he's really looking for something or somebody throws that Nasty big old breaking ball, but other than that, he's right into the pitch. All four to him. A two out walk in the seventh. When you look at the heart of this order, though, Ramirez, Justice, Matt Williams, Jim Tomey, even Alomar after them, you put a guy on, you're one swing away from this being a close ball game again. It seems as if the Marlins are cruising, but if Cook should groove one now for Matt Williams, they're back within 7-5. At 33 home runs for Justice, all with over 100 RBIs. 32 home runs for Williams and 40 for Tommy. High fly ball to right. Sheffield has it lined up. It's stretch time in Florida. Game one of the Marlins' first ever World Series, and they lead it seven to three. Leading seven to three, the Marlins fans have stretched, enjoying the first ever World Series game in South Florida as we move to the bottom half of the seventh. You know, if this score holds up, and then you look ahead to tomorrow night, you have to say that the pitching pairing favors. The Marlins, Kevin Brown against Chad OJ. Mm -hmm. They could get out of here in pretty good shape before they get on the plane to Cleveland. Only is one for two with a walk. Eric Plunk still in there as we go to the bottom of the seventh. Starts Bonilla with strike one. Conine and Moises Alou to follow. One. When a guy throws as hard as Plunk does and wears glasses, it leaves you feeling just a bit uneasy. Well, he does you a favor a lot of times by throwing you the off speed stuff. He's got a very good splitter and a fastball, way plus 90. Line to right, in there in front of Ramirez for a leadoff single. Bonilla's second hit of the game. That's what I was talking about right there. That was a splitter. That was a splitter from Plunk. This is what I talked about. I think he does you a favor sometimes by throwing you the splitter. Here it is, and it hangs up. It hangs up. There it is, right there. Stays about waist high. Bonilla jumps all over it and lines it to right for a base hit. The seventh Florida hit. Cleveland has eight, but where it counts, it's seven three Marlins. This whole area electrified by the Marlins postseason run. And of course, it'll be a raucous atmosphere when we get to Cleveland. It's fascinating because there were question marks surrounding the Marlin franchise only a couple of months ago. And not all of them have been resolved. Potential double play ball. Roberts to Vizquel, low throw, but Omar handles it, and they double Conine at the other end, 4-6-3. Remember, coming up for most of you after the game, your late local news, then an all-new Saturday Night Live with guest host Brendan Frazier. But for those of you who want more baseball on CNBC, an extended post-game show,
hosted by Keith Oberman and Hannah Storm. Moises Alou, one for three, but that one hit was the game's biggest. It snapped a 1-1 tie, a three-run homer, off the foul pole and left at the expense of Oral Hershiser. That came in the fourth. In their first year, the Marlins drew more than three million fans. Then they were really hurt by the strike. That took a lot of momentum away from them. The same thing didn't happen to the Rockies. The strike eventually settled, and the fans kept coming to Coors Field, but it didn't work that way here, and their attendance fell off. 2-0. Then they committed all that money in the offseason, $89 million of it, to improve their team and acquire free agents. It paid off at the gate. Their attendance increased, but not enough to offset the additional financial commitments. And Wade Heisenga claims he lost $30 million this year and talked about selling the team. Eventually, despite the sellout crowd here, they need a new ballpark. This is just a reconfigured football stadium. They probably prefer that it be a retractable roof facility, given all the thunderstorms in the summer here. So they're working on that. Who knows what the future of the franchise is, but right now they're reveling in a World Series. And Alou draws a four-pitch walk. Well, every place we've been, and uh, and uh, no matter where you go in, in Florida, I mean, the talk is the Marlins, and it's, it's kind of strange, Bob, because for the most part, it's been basketball and football here, but uh, the fans, and again, it, it took the Marlins to get to postseason. They were still upset prior to postseason. I mean, fans weren't showing up here. They were booing the Marlins. And, and until they got to the postseason, and these fans realized, hey, we've got ourselves a pretty good ball club here, did they start coming out in droves? A strike to Charles Johnson, whose fourth inning home run was estimated at 438 feet. Well, I'd have to measure that again. That's, that's the upper deck up there. That thing wasn't even coming down yet when he hit the seats. Yeah, I would have guessed it was more than 438. Oh, yeah. 442. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with these people? You could see that from here. <laughs> what happened with that tail of the tape that they do in ballparks during the summer? 0 oh 2. As we noted during the league championship series, if he hit just 200, his defensive skills alone would justify your having him in there. But he's become a dangerous hitter, especially in the late innings. A mile high pop into shallow right. Roberts out. Ramirez in. It's Manny. And that'll do it in the bottom of the seventh. It remains 7 3 Florida in game one of the World Series. On to the eighth, Dennis Cook has worked an inning and a third of scoreless ball out of the bullpen. That gives him exactly seven innings of postseason pitching this year, and no one scored on him. He turned 35 just as the playoffs were beginning. He didn't know better. You guess he's had that hat all 35 of those years. That is a mangy-looking chapeau. Tommy fouls it off. He homered his last time up, breaking a long drought. More than a month had gone by since he last connected. Well, Mike Hargrove said that he's starting to hit the ball a little bit better. He's starting to make better contact. That last fastball from Cook, I mean, Tommy was right on it. Had a good cut and fouled it back. Then we got a piece of Johnson and Montague. He had a good cut at that ball. Kind of a standoff between <laughs> Cook and Tommy. You want to throw it? Come on, throw it. I'll wait right here. Bring it on. Kind of interesting, though, Tommy. Tommy has not been facing a lot of left-handed pitchers, and he's had two pretty good cuts here. Yeah, this is an important at bat because Leiter and Saunders are likely to pitch in some order, games three and four in Cleveland. Tommy has no history against the rookie Saunders. Mike Hargrove told us he's one for ten lifetime against Leiter, who used to be in the American League. And even with the 40 home runs, no guarantee he plays both of those games. Well, Tommy said the one for ten, the one hit he had off Leiter was a home run. He drops down side off. Ooh. Doesn't miss by much. After a couple of fastballs, I thought he might come from the side, which he will do every once in a while. Cook doesn't do it too often, but every once in a while against the left-hander, he'll drop down sidearm style and try to get you moving out of it. Oh 
almost a still life that we're looking at here. Could just as well be a bowl of fruit with some flowers in the background. <laughs> I'll let him know that tomorrow. I didn't mean it. No, I'm in talking any way no. that could be. I'm talking about inferred a with a button. negative meaning. No matter if it's infrared or not. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> you looking at me? <laughs> Who are you looking at, pal? Oh. Goodbye. Tommy swings and fouls a fastball back. Another fastball inside. Threw him a lot of fastballs off the plate outside and right down the middle. Did not throw him a breaking ball. Tommy obviously looking for a breaking ball and he did not get one. Leland has Jay Powell, the right hander, throwing. He's been throwing for a while. Now, two right handed hitters, Alomar and Grissom, are due. So Cook is done after being very effective in his stint. And we go to Greg Gumble. Thanks, Greg. We can only imagine and cringe. <laughs> so tomorrow, a day of sports on NBC that could have come to you by way of Zane Gray. We've got the Cowboys and the Indians. The Cowboys early on the football field and the Indians late on the baseball diamond. Another good performance by Dennis Cook. I'll tell you, he's been around a long time, Bob. As you said, he's been with a number of ball clubs, but he still throws very well. He throws strikes. He's not overpowering anymore, but he makes pitches on you. Doesn't have a really big curveball, but but uh, he's a veteran. He's been around and he knows what he's doing. That's obvious. And a ball to Alomar, who singled his last time up, is only hitting three trips tonight. He's barely hitting 200 in the postseason, as you see, but he's gone deep three times. And he got the huge game-winning hit in game four in the ninth inning against Baltimore at Jacobs Field. Two and one. Jay Powell is 25 years old. From Collinsville, Tennessee. He was seven and two this year. Seldom in a closers role. Had a couple of saves. Up right side, Johnson and Conine into foul territory. Conine. This pitch around the outside part, and Sandy may have tried to pull that ball. He picked up a base hit to right field back in the sixth inning. This time he tried to try to pull an outside fastball and popped it up to Conine in foul territory. There it is again, little sinker, and around the outside corner, and Alomar pops it up. And let's take a look. Pitch on the outside corner, right on the corner. Good pitch there from Powell. For those of you who haven't been with us earlier in the postseason, just tuning in now as the World Series rolls around, supervision is a computer tracking of the pitch. It tracks its speed and its break. Grissom has struck out, doubled, and singled. You know this is a strong lineup, not the same lineup that had Albert Bell and Kenny Lofton at the top, but you have to be a strong lineup when Marquise Grissom hits eighth. And that's eighth with the pitcher in there. In a DH lineup, there have been some times when he's been slotted ninth. Well, they're definitely a different type of ball club than they were before. And they think they're better equipped to play against National League teams. Two and two. Two years ago, in a season shortened by the continuing strike, Cleveland won 100 games and lost 44, one of the great single season teams of modern times. This year, not nearly that sort of juggernaut, but back in the World Series. The 2 2, full count. It's a mark of modern baseball that we're only two years removed from the 95 World Series, yet it seems like an eternity, and only 10 players remain on this World Series roster who were part of the Indians' pennant winning season in 95. And actually, only three everyday players Alomar, Vizquel, and Manny Ramirez. Also, Jim Tomey. Tomey, I'm sorry, four players. Four and Grissom is aboard with two out. 
not a running situation anyway since they trailed by four. Grissom stole 22 this year. There was a time as Ed Vosberg gets ready that are in left hander a time when Grissom was one of the most feared base stealers in the majors stole 76 and 78 in consecutive seasons when he was with the Expos early in this decade. Brian Giles now comes on as a pinch hitter. The absence of the DH removes him from the lineup. In American League games Justice has often DH and Giles has played left. And he'll be back in there somewhere when we get to Cleveland. Fouls the first pitch back. And David Justice, in, in talking about coming back to play in the outfield, mm -hmm. said how much easier it is to play and how much more rattled he is as a DH when he has to sit on the bench in close games. He said he just he cannot make himself sit still when he's DHing in a close game. He said he's got to be up and down and walking around. At least when you're in the field, you get to relax a little bit and do some chasing defensively. Kyle shouldn't give Grissom a lot of concern. Try to get the hitter. Conine holding him with two down to the eighth. Giles was one of the names tossed around when the Indians tried to put a package together to pry Kurt Schilling loose from the Phillies. Around the All-Star game, chances appeared better than 50-50 that the Indians would pull it off, but Schilling stayed put. One and two. In fact, when Schilling came to Cleveland for the All-Star game, the fans there cheered his every move, trying to make it clear to him that he would love wearing an Indian uniform. <laughs> well, Brian Giles, instead of uh, taking what the Bat Boy had brought out, has, has got his own selection. In. Now it's going to take some pine tar and rosin. And Giles, a definite long ball threat, hit 17 homers this year. And again, as this game moves along at kind of a slow pace, the last few innings, he could be low to sleep. If he jolts one here, it's seven to five. Setting up some potential drama in the ninth. Two and two. Well, this crowd in Miami, despite or in Florida, despite the fact that it's a record setting crowd, has really not been firing off tonight. I mean, they've done it a couple of times, but it's, it's not what I expected to see with this kind of a crowd. Every Not once in a while, somebody starts to get up, Bob, and you see it moving around the stadium, but that's it. Full count as Johnson slides over to block it. Nothing like the electricity we felt here in their last home game, game five, when LeVon Hernandez struck out the 15 Atlanta Braves. Oh, they were rocking and rolling from the opening inning on. And, and today, even on our arrival here, I mean, the parking lots were jammed and everybody was firing up. Not so inside tonight. That, of course, was a one-run game in doubt to the final pitch. Here they lead 7-3. The runner goes on the 3-2 pitch in the air to deep right center field. Sheffield over, can't get it. It's down in the gap, and coming home is Marquise Grissom and Giles on his way to third with a pinch hit triple. Close play, but he's in there. So it's 7-4. Well, Giles fought off a couple of pitches, got a fastball out over the plate, and ripped it in the right center field. Sheffield runs it down. Now, Sheffield finally gets it, and then he bobbles it. Giles rounds second base. He heads over to third. Giles takes a fastball over the middle of the plate, just rips it in the right center. Now he decides he wants to go for three. Strike one to Pip Roberts, who's two for four. A single could make things interesting. Well, 
Well, here's Giles as he rounded second base on his way to third. A risky play because with two outs and trailing by four runs, three runs at the time. You never want to make the last out, especially when you're trailing, last out of an inning at third base. It's one thing to take that risk with nobody out or one out, get in a position where you can score on and out, but with two down, unless you're certain, it's not worth it. Bobby Bonilla, again, the veteran type here, and, and coming in and talking with Jay Powell, I mean, Bip Roberts, if he reaches, brings a tying run to the plate. And, and Bonilla in there, trying to get him to throw strikes, slow him down a little bit, and throw strikes to Roberts. Which he can't do, at least not yet. Three and one, Vizquel on deck. Well, again, here you've got Roberts sitting on a 3-1 pitch with Giles at third. Two men are out. And, and Cleveland very much back in this game. Full count. Now Nen, the closer, joins Vosburgh. They usually don't like to bring Nen in except at the start of an inning. They don't like to hand him the ball with men on base and a rally underway. I saw an example of that in Atlanta when they let Kevin Brown finish the ball game. Ball four. The Scal hit only five home runs during the regular season. He is now the tying run at the plate in the eighth. Well, the Bip Roberts, he threw a breaking ball for a strike. Then he could not find the range. Off speed. Breaking ball, sinker in, and a foul ball, three and one. And then he misses way inside on three and two. Now Jim Leland was about to go out, but it's Larry Rothschild now. He was about to go out and take him out of the game. He sends Rothschild out there now to try and see if he can settle Powell down. Bob said Nen is ready, and uh, along with Eddie Vosberg in case. But I mean, he's got the tying run to the plate now. You know Omar Vizquel, and uh, not to say that Vizquel is gonna gonna pop one here, but every once in a while he's he's done it. You never know, but it's the tying run. That's the big thing. Something you have to be aware of, especially if Powell gets careless here. Even though he is not the tying run, if they let Bip Roberts get a big lead, he could steal second here with Vizquel at the plate, not being a home run threat. Putting them in a situation where a single brings them to within one with another inning to play. All one down and in. Well, most run, most managers will not run in this situation for two reasons. One, if he gets thrown out, you take you out of the inning. The other is obviously Charles Johnson behind the plate makes it unwise to try this in, in most situations. Valid considerations both, especially the second one. Well, Hargrove told us before the game, he said, I'm not going to do anything foolish against this guy. We know how well he can throw. Talking about Charles Johnson. There you see it, CJ's rule. But Powell all over the place here on Roberts and now on Vizquel. Finally a strike. Turning the conventional wisdom about the two leagues on its head, Cleveland has stolen 11 bases in the postseason. Florida only three. Three and one. Ramirez, who has a homer in this game, will be next. We talked earlier about the Indians not being out of this thing when they were down by five. And here they're right back in it. Three one pitch bounced foul. Two things happened to get them back in the ball game. One was he didn't want to leave Dennis Cook in very long because he wants to use him a lot in this series if they have to go seven. So he brought him, took him out when he was doing the job, and now Jay Powell not able to do the job. Conai moves behind the runner, who will go on the 3-2 pitch. Cold strike three. The scowl was frozen. The threat is ended. Seven four models. 
remember, you know, kid back there can throw. So if I give it to you, tell you you're on your own, you got to give yourself a good jump. All right. OK, right now we're sitting. Well, Davey Nelson talking <laughs> to the runner at first. He kind of took a little heat off himself when he said, you're on your own. <laughs> but if you get a jump, go. But make sure you can get a jump if you do indeed try to steal. So that kid got a kid got a kid's got a great arm. Talking about Johnson. But then he added, right now we're sitting, mm -hmm. which meant that at least for that pitch, Roberts was not on his own. Mm -hmm. Paul Ossenmacher becomes the fourth pitcher. Hershiser, Juden, and Plunk preceded him. Craig Council bunts foul on the first pitch of the bottom of the eighth. The veteran Ossenmacher was 5-0 and this year. His ERA was slightly less than three. Postseason record, he's 2-0. and He's given up a few hits and a few runs, but he is still 2-0 and in the postseason. The pitching coach Mark Wiley alongside Hargrove. Council's one for two with a walk. He had a third inning double. Behind on the count here 0 and 2. Rookie from Notre Dame. One and two. John Cangelosi has moved into the on deck circle. Meaning that Jay Powell is done. Cangelosi will pinch hit and Rob Nen will become the fourth Florida pitcher trying to close it out in a save situation in the ninth. Hernandez started, Cook followed, then Powell. Roll to first, Tomey takes it himself. Sunday at noon Eastern on our football coverage, Deion Sanders talks attitude. We don't have that edge that we once had. We don't have that fear factor that we once had. People aren't scared of us anymore. We've been exposed. Plus the budding rivalry between the Jets and the Patriots, the NFL on NBC, noon Eastern, tomorrow. Jets and Patriots had that great Sunday night game early in the season that the Jets almost won, missed a late field goal at the end of regulation, then lost in overtime. Angelosi taking a strike, switch hitter, facing Ossenmacher, with one out on the bottom of the eighth. And the Marlins leading it seven to four. The big inning was the fourth. Three run homer by Alou immediately followed by a titanic solo shot off the bat of Charles Johnson. Hit well but foul. The Marlin bench is better than it has been in previous years. They still have the useful Alex Arias, who's been with them since their inception in 1993. But now they have Dalton if he doesn't start. And if Dalton is in there, then Conine comes off the bench. They have Eisenreich. They have Cangelosi, who can go up there and get a walk or punch a single for you. Or in this case, sit down with a strikeout. There's a big breaking ball from Paul Ossenmacher, and Cangelosi couldn't check his swing. That was an excuse me job. Here's that curveball again by Ossenmacher. He's got a beauty. Number one pitch. There you see it down low and inside, and Cangelosi can't check his swing. That was an excuse me job on that low inside curve. You see that breaking ball down low and away, down six inches, and a break off the outside. So Ossenmacher records two quick outs in the eighth. Bringing up Devon White. 0 for 3 with a walk. Another valuable reserve for Jim Leland is whichever second baseman doesn't play. Craig Council and Kurt Abbott have been dividing duties. Council started tonight. Well, the Marlins have a very fine bench, and Leland knows how to use it. Nelson Mocker quickly ahead of White 0 and 2. There's Kurt Abbott. Veteran middle infielder playing mostly second base these days as Renteria takes care of the shortstop duties. One and two. In the ninth for Cleveland, 
It's the middle of their order. Ramirez, Justice, Matt Williams. If anybody gets on, then Hargrove has Tommy and Alomar waiting. On a pitch down and in, White fans. Alomar has to toss it to Tommy to make it an official strikeout. Two of them in the inning for Ossenmacher. Enter Rob Nen as expected, nine and three for the year, 35 saves. He blew seven saves during the regular season. He has the widest possible margin of error for it's still to be considered a save situation, a three-run lead, as he starts the ninth with strike one to Matty Ramirez. Two walks, a home run, and he's fly to right. Quickly 0 and 2. Statistically, this was the worst start of Oral Hirschheiser's distinguished postseason career. And if this holds up, the 39-year-old veteran will lose to a rookie, Levon Hernandez. One and two. Hernandez was not brilliant. Five and two thirds, eight hits, three runs. He struck out five and walked two, but he stands to be the winner. Hershiser lasted just four and a third and gave up seven earned runs, six hits, and he walked four. Well, the question now is will he pitch game four? He being Hernandez or Hershiser? Hershiser. Well, they've got Jarrett Wright, the rookie, penciled in for game four, and then Hershiser would come back in game five the way it's set up now. Which is they're going to, the Marlins aren't going to pitch Hernandez in game four either, so. They would probably match up again. Jared Wright, something of a sensation at the start of the playoffs, and now Mike Hargrove quoted as saying, look, he's just a kid. He may not have much gas left in his tank. He's never pitched this many innings or this deep into a season. Renteria at short. Takes care of Ramirez, out number one in the ninth. Two years ago, the World Series began in the National League City. And Mike Hargrove's Indians lost the first two to the Braves in Atlanta and never really recovered. Here, they're a couple of outs away from going down 0-1. They've stranded 10, just one for 10 on the night with runners in scoring position. They've had six extra base hits, including two solo homers, but haven't made the most of them, trailing 7-4. Justice had an RBI single in the first. He's one for three with a walk. Strike one from Nen. Well, there's no messing around here with, with Rob Nen. I'm coming at you with a fastball. And I talked to him before the game tonight. He said, I really feel good. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for every game. This ball is jolted to right. Sheffield after it can't get it. One hop against the wall. Wide turn. And Justice, considering the score, is content with a single. One thing about Justice, it doesn't matter how hard you throw, if you get the ball out over the plate, he's going to hammer you. This ball is supposed to be inside, but watch. See, it moves out over the plate, and Justice likes the ball out over the plate. I mean, he will rip you. I don't care if it's a curveball or change up or a fastball out over the plate, he's going to hit it hard. You know, Joe, and Gary Sheffield looks like he's really out of gas in right field. I think he makes the play on that ball if he's running full bore, but he's just out of gas. Matt Williams. Working on an 0 for 4 night and taking a strike on the inside edge. Sheffield just gutting it out in right field. We thought when they established a big lead that Jim Leland might give him the rest of the night off, but Sheffield has gone the full nine. Threw it by him, 0-2. Well, a 90, 91 mile an hour fastball up and in on Matt Williams. He never could catch up to it. Here it's coming right at you. Around the inside, and again, Williams can't get those arms extended on that pitch inside. Bonilla with a diving play. He throws across the diamond. Safe. Well, the Indians have the tying run at the plate again. 
Well, we talked about the defense that Benia has displayed here in the postseason. This is another example. He doesn't have time to get up, so he throws it one hop. And Matt Williams barely beats this play at first base. Nice play by Conine, but an even better play by Benia. Throws off balance, gets him to one hopper, but good hustle by Matt Williams. Boy, that's close. Mm -hmm. Wow, he may have been out. Could have been. We we get to look at it nine different times after the fact. Tony, the tying run at the plate, fouls it back. He had a home run earlier tonight. It came in the sixth. Off LeVon Hernandez to the opposite field, as you see. Well, if you're the Indians, you were down so far. All you wanted to do was get the tying run to the plate with one of your big sluggers there, and they have that with Jim Tomey here. Alomar on deck. 0 oh and 2. And look at that. Triple digits. 101 on our gun. Well, the high fastball is where you'll get your highest reading. And this is definitely a high fastball with some heat on it. Jim Tomey cannot catch up with it. And down he goes. And that one was ratcheted up one more mile per hour to 102. Well, a fastball up, and this one's really up. Can't catch up with it. This one just throws it right by him. That one's almost down the middle of the plate. Tommy can't catch up with it. Well, I was kind of surprised, Joe, that he threw up. It looked like a low outside breaking ball, a slider on Williams, that he picked up the infield single line with a play by Bonilla. This time against Tommy, he comes right at him with fastball. Ball one to Alamo, but he is throwing some high octane mm. gas. Here it is, 101, 102. See what you can do with it. Alomar has already had some big moments this postseason. Does he have one more in him? A ball and a strike. Two out, two on. Sandy's the tying run at the plate. Seven for Marlins, top of the ninth, game one of the World Series. Andy's one for four tonight. One strike away from a game one victory. And he's just reaching back, getting everything that he has, and he's saying, if you can catch up with it, go ahead. And instead of messing around with the breaking ball, I mean, he's got to come with the express again on Alomar here and preferably upstairs. Breaking ball, it looked like, and he fouled it back. Yeah, and it looked like a hanger, as a matter of fact, right over the middle, and Alomar had the good cut and fouled it back. You're right, Bob. It was a high slider. There it is. Hung right there. Wow. Mm. I don't believe that. You know, you think back to Mark Wallers and Jim Lairitz and getting beaten on a slider in a situation like that in last year's World Series. When you're throwing this kind of heat, life full around. Yeah, but he also so and hit one off Mariano Rivera, high fastball away. He's still alive. Well, the flash balls were popping all around the park on the game's first pitch, and now it starts again in anticipation of what could be the final pitch. 67,245 here. It's the largest crowd to see a World Series game anywhere since 1963. Game one between the Yankees and the Dodgers when Sandy Koufax struck out 15 at Yankee Stadium. The one two pitch. Got him. Game one belongs to the Marlins as Nen closes it with a flourish.
say this for the Marlins. During the season, they won 8 of 12 head-to-head -head from the Braves. In interleague play, they swept the three-game series from Baltimore. And now, against the best competition that can be thrown at them, they've won 8 out of 10 postseason games. Today's Chevrolet player of the game is Moises Alou, who hit the big three-run home run, and he is now with Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Moses, tell us about the home run that broke this game open in the fourth inning. Well, I, I, I cut a break right there. I mean, this guy has very good stuff. Uh, it reminded me of Greg Maddox. I mean, his ball was moving a lot, uh, but I wanted to stay aggressive in that at bat. He threw me some pretty good sinkers. Uh, that was a sinker that I don't know how, how I kept that ball in fair territory. Let me ask you, before game one in the NLCS, Jim Leland told the guys, hey, this one isn't the important one. Game four is. But tonight he emphasized winning game one. What was the big difference, and what's the difference in this series in getting game one? I think every every game is big. I mean, to get the first one is, is awesome. Uh, now we have to keep playing this, uh, the same way. I mean, we're playing a tough team, a team that never gave up, a team that battled, that came, kept coming back. But, uh, I mean, we got some, some runs, and we got some pretty good pitching, too. Congratulations. They're chanting your name. Thank you. All right, Bob, let's send it back upstairs to you. All right, Jim, thanks a lot. And maybe not for sale. Maybe Wayne Huizenga will say, I'll sustain the losses if it's this much fun. Flash bulbs popping. And Sandy Alomar swinging and missing at Rob Nen's final fastball. So once again, our final score in game one of the World Series, the Marlins seven and the Indians four tomorrow after an NFL doubleheader. Game two of the World Series with coverage beginning at 7 Eastern time, 4 o'clock Pacific time. Chad O.J. for Cleveland. Kevin Brown, the Marlins ace, scheduled to pitch game two. Tonight after your late local news and all news Saturday Night Live, hosted by George of the Jungle, Brendan Frazier, with musical guest Bjork. For those of you who want to continue with postgame activities, join Keith Oakman and Hannah Storm for our World Series postgame show immediately following this telecast on CNBC. For Joe Morgan, Bob Euchre, Jim Gray, Hannah Storm, and Keith Oberman, I'm Bob Costas. Good night.